Well, hello, Hearth and Homies. Thanks for joining us for the OTR Visual Radio. Tonight's show is Counter Spy. This show aired on the NBC Blue Network and the Mutual Network from May 18, 1942 until November 29, 1957. The show featured Don McLaughlin as David Harding, the chief of the United States Counter Spies. The show also stars Mendel Kramer, who many of you know as The Last Johnny Dollar. This show was created by Philip H. Lord, who had also created Gangbusters. And it said that Lord had to create a fictional counter spy office because he had had, quote, a certain amount of difficulty with J. Edgar Hoover over the story content of Gangbusters. The show progressed through three different phases. The early shows take place during World War II, so they deal mostly with counter spies against the Axis enemies. Of course, after the war, we have Cold War threats. And then finally, it just moved into all types of illegal activity. What we're going to hear tonight is the earlier show, so that's primarily going to be taking place during World War II. And a fun little treat, the last episode of this compilation is going to feature a rehearsal of a show. So you're going to hear all the outtakes and the laughter and kind of the behind the scenes look at the show. Now, right after this live stream, stay tuned because you'll be taken right over to our sister channel, Hearth and Home Nostalgia, for part two. And we invite you to check out our sister channel. You're going to find a lot of the same great content that you enjoy over here, plus some bonuses. And we're doing this to kind of uh, help celebrate the fact that over there, we've gotten over a thousand subscribers and we've actually gotten monetized on that channel. If you've tuned into this channel regularly, you know, we've kind of had some ups and downs with monetization, not being monetized back and forth. And of course, one way you can help support this channel is by joining the Johnny Dollar Club. That's right. For just a dollar a month, you can help support the channel. Just check out the links. They're in the description below. They're also in the chat and they're also in the comments. And you can sign up through patreon.com, buymeacoffee.com, and now coffee.com. And just to let you know, those of you that prefer PayPal, coffee.com gives you the option to sign up on a monthly basis or just give a one-time gift through PayPal. And of course, another way you can help support this channel indirectly is by joining us over at Hearth and Home Nostalgia, subscribing there and watching some of the great content we have over there. And in doing so, you're kind of supporting our family of channels. But now let's get on with our show, Counter Spy. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Washington calling counter spy. Washington calling counter spy. Washington calling counter spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. The Blue Network presents Phillips H. Lord's Counter Spy. Backing our great army and navy at the front is our invisible army of United States counter spies who work quietly, effectively, and swiftly against the enemies in our midst. They are the dread of the German Gestapo, the Italian Obra, and the Japanese Black Dragons. Imagine the ace counter spy of them all as David Harding, specially appointed with authority to work however or wherever he will. Three weeks ago, in Washington, a very prominent bachelor by the name of William R. Terrace stood in the center of his expensive apartment. The time? 11.25 at night. A dim light burned on a little ebony side table. Mr. Terrace stood there. His face was ashen white. Great beads of perspiration stood out on his forehead. Go on. You betrayed your country. Go on. Go on, pull the trigger, you coward. Go on! Tell the editor to hold the press. William R. Terrace has just committed 
suicide in his living room. He left a note saying it was because of ill health. <laughs> It's a clear-cut case of suicide, Mr. Harding. You're the chief, and what you say goes, but it's just the case of a wealthy bachelor in poor health. Well, I admit, Mark, William Terrace probably did commit suicide. But remember this. We're at war. The Gestapo are experts at making a murder appear to be a suicide. Then you're really going to investigate it? Well, I think I'll at least ask a few questions. Yes, sir. Now, the note Terrace left, Mark said he was committing suicide because of ill health. So I think I'll drop in on his doctor and see how bad his health really was. You would know, doctor, if Mr. Terrace was in poor health. I was shocked at his suicide, Mr. Harding. From everything I know, Mr. Terrace was in perfect health. Mm. That's quite interesting. I think I'll go over to Mr. Terrace's bank and see if finances were worrying him. No, Mr. Harding. Mr. Terrace's finances were in perfect condition. He was worth nearly three quarters of a million. He had many government bonds and securities. Thank you. Mark, when a man commits suicide... And it isn't his health, and it isn't finances. Look for the woman. Exactly. And that's what I want you to do, Mark. Yes, sir. Now pick six men, cover Washington from head to foot, and find out what woman William Terrace paid special attention to. Yes? Mr. Harding, I've just completed that investigation. Man in question was spotless, described as congenial, social, friendly, but never escorted any particular woman. Was known to be very proper and old-fashioned in ideals. All right, Mark, that ends that lead. Meet me later. I'm going to take a long chance and visit the accounting firm which checked Terrace's books. <laughs> Why, yes, Mr. Harding. We've been the accountants for Mr. Terrace's firm for nine years. I want you to go to Mr. Terrace's office and get his office pad of appointments for the past year. Now, check that appointment list for lapses of time. Then check those dates against his personal checks and see what checks were made out during those periods of absences. This should tell us where Mr. Terrace was during those absences. <laughs> Mr. Harding, we went over Mr. Terrace's office pad and found he was absent from his business during the past year on four different occasions, a week at each time. Good. Now, during those absences, did he make out any checks? His first absence corresponds with a check he made out at the Saratoga Hotel, Saratoga Springs. During Mr. Terrace's second absence, he made out a check at the clubhouse, Pine Hill, South Carolina. This third check was made out at a clubhouse, Atlanta, Georgia. Fine, thank you. Proceed. This is G6, calling from Saratoga Springs. Man in question spent week here in company of woman. Dark complexion, about 31. Expensively dressed, unusually attractive. Full report follows. Fine. Proceed. G8, reporting from Pine Hill, South Carolina. Man in question stayed here accompanied by unknown woman in early 30s. Most attractive, expensively gowned, dark. Report follows. <laughs> This is beginning to get very interesting, Mr. Hardy. Yet we may still be on a wild goose chase, Mark. We have no idea who that girl was. She may have been perfectly all right. But uh, how can we ever find her? She may be anywhere. Well, here's a little something I dug up. April 2nd, William Terrace made out a check to the Washington Jewelry Company for $8,000. Hmm. Say, that's a pretty sizable amount for a bachelor to be making out to send to a jewelry house. That's what I thought, Mark. 
I'm going to check that jewelry house. I wonder just what William Terrace bought with that $8,000. Mr. Terrace bought a solitaire diamond ring, ten and one half carats, platinum setting, a woman's ring. We have no record that he said whom he was buying it for. That is all. Thank you. Well, Mark, now we know that Mr. Terrace bought a ring for some woman. But who is she? Where is she? Oh, that's a tough question, Mr. Harding. Well, let's put two and two together and try to make five. Check all insurance companies, Mark. Yes. And see if within a few days after April the 2nd, any woman insured a ring for approximately $8,000. Say, that's clever reasoning. You win, Harding. We're getting hot. Here's the insurance report. April 5th. The solitaire diamond ring, platinum setting, was insured for $8,000 by a Miss Avery Rollins of 1370 Lincoln Boulevard, Northwest, Washington. Rollins. Avery Rollins. That name's very familiar. She's high society, Mr. Harding. Lives with her uncle and aunt. Uh-huh. Now, I got a report on her. Age 32, uh-huh. height 5 feet 5, light hair, uh-huh. light complexion, very social, educated at the Sorbonne, Paris. Above reproach. Yeah, but the woman seen with William Terrace at the resorts was dark, dark hair. But the weights are approximately the same, both apparently wealthy, both smart dressers. Mark, there's something wrong, something very wrong. It's a problem that's got to be approached from some unusual angle. <laughs> Well, you have a very luxurious apartment here, Colonel Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Harding. I'm pretty proud of it, especially this library den. I'm here to make a very unusual request, Colonel. As you may know, I'm a United States counter-spy. Yes, I do. Now, Colonel, you knew William Terrace personally, didn't you? Oh, yes. Was his suicide a bona fide suicide, Mr. Harding? Well, if you're perfectly frank, Colonel Reynolds, I don't know. That's why I've come to you. I need the aid of a citizen, Colonel, prominent, who has some government responsibility. Now, you're 48. That's correct. A bachelor? <laughs> a confirmed one. You're a very handsome man. Oh, come now, come. Yes, and very fascinating to women. Now, wait a minute, Colonel, Harding. Oh, this is very serious business. Now, you're chairman on the board for the new airplane formations and armor. Yeah? That makes you a very interesting person to certain other persons. Colonel, do you happen to know a Miss Avery Rollins? A very gorgeous woman, but I've never happened to meet her. She's usually surrounded by any number of admirers. Well, I'm going to arrange for you to meet her, Colonel Reynolds. And I'm going to ask you to make yourself just as interesting to her as possible. In fact, I'm going to ask you to try and make it even a uh, constant attachment for a time. What? Oh, no, Harding, that's a little too much. I don't wish to get mixed up with women. Now, Colonel Reynolds, you could be the principal factor in possibly exposing one of the most cunning spy rings in this country today. You don't think Avery Rollins was in any way connected with Terrace's suicide? You don't think she's acting as a spy? That's what I want to find out, Colonel. Good Lord, Harvey. I've arranged with Lady Keston to give a formal ball next Friday evening. I've given her a list of guests she's to include. Miss Rollins will be one. And I'd appreciate your being another and casually meeting her. Naturally, Rollins. Huh. Mr. Harding, under these circumstances, no man could refuse. I thought you'd feel that way, sir. Now, after you meet her... Please don't try to contact me in any way. Leave it up to me to find out what you're doing. Three weeks later, March 23rd. Washington, after hour, was joined by a woman already on train. She is of dark complexion, expensively dressed, very attractive. 
black hair, height approximately five feet five, ticket reads Palm Springs. That is all. That's strange. That's not the description of Avery Rollins. Washington, our later joined woman already on train, dark complexion, expensively dressed, very beautiful and exotic, weight 110 pounds, tickets read Atlanta, Georgia. Who is meeting Colonel Reynolds on these trips? Is it Avery Rollins or who is it? Come in. Oh, hello, Mark. Hello, Miss Darney. I just got the facts on that dark girl who's been meeting the colonel. Good. What did you find out? You were right, sir. After the girl got off the train with the colonel, I went to her compartment. There were unmistakable signs of dark-colored powder, blonde hair, and black hair which showed at the end of the hair, as if it had come out of a wig. Mm. Now, she must get on the train, get a compartment, and change her appearance before she comes out and meets the colonel. And it is Avery Rollins. Because she's been absent from Washington at the same time as the colonel has. She probably explained to the colonel that because of their prominent standing in Washington, she must disguise herself. Then, the way I see it, this Avery Rollins must have been the mysterious dark woman with whom William Terrace went off on trips before he was murdered. Without a doubt. And she's connected with his murder in some manner. And I've got to make sure the colonel isn't killed the same way. She's off now down at Virginia Beach with him. What a sunset, Avery. Mm, beautiful. I love to lie on the beach after all the others have gone in. Look at those breakers on the sea. John, sometimes I see a look come over your face. A, a look of pain. Anything troubling you? No, dear. Nothing really. Perhaps you're worrying about your responsibilities. Those uh, new war plans or something. No, I don't think I am. Oh, I wish we didn't have to go back to Washington tomorrow. We must, though. I've got some important conferences. Here, uh, put these in your bag, will you, Avery? I'm afraid I'll lose them in the sand. Oh, but why bring keys down to the beach? I don't dare leave them in the hotel room. The flat one is the key to the secret cabinet in my library. It has the government plans we're drawing up. Oh, no, no, John. Don't give me the keys. It's too big a responsibility. Well, all right. I'll hide them next time under the rug at the hotel. Oh, silly. <laughs> Let's go in the water. Come on. Uh, all right. I'll beat you to it. Oh, you just try. <laughs> Oh, I was looking for you, Harding. Well, hello, Colonel Reynolds. Glad to see you. Sit down. Thank you. Now, I thought it might be better for us to meet openly at the hotel here rather than for me to go again to your apartment. A good many things have happened since we last talked, Harding. Yes. And you've proved yourself a veteran. A professional counter-spy couldn't have done better. Anything the matter, Harding? Well, I think the big moment's here. It's now or never. What shall I do? Now, I'd like to have you invite Miss Rollins up to your apartment Tuesday night for a formal dinner. Just you two. I'll try. You don't think, do you, Harding, Miss Rollins really is a spy? Yes, Colonel. I do. But I kept the key to my secret file where she could get it. Called her attention to it. Harding, tell me the truth. You don't think Miss Rollins was the girl who was with Terrace on those trips before he committed suicide? Yes. His blood is on her hands, Colonel. And probably the blood of a dozen other men. Now, Tuesday night, after you've had dinner, I wish you'd go with her into your library den for coffee. But under no conditions, Colonel, drink the coffee. Now, I'll casually drop in a little later. Hmm. You intend to break her Tuesday night? If I can. And I hope I can. What's the matter, Colonel? You're white as a sheet. I... I'm all right. Uh, can I get you something? 
Uh, no. What is it, Colonel? You can tell me. Harding, I love her. You don't mean that. Yes. Yes, I do mean it. I love her. But good heavens, man, you can't. But I do. I think she's innocent. She didn't try to copy the key. She, she's never tried to ask me questions about secret government affairs. But she's a murderess, Colonel. Take my word for it, the blood of Terrace is on her. She'd double-cross you in a second. I didn't realize how lonely I'd been. She's so clever, smart, beautiful, everything about her. I can't stand it. You're not thinking of doing what William Terrace did? No. No, not that. I guess I can see it through. I'm sorry, Colonel. Terribly sorry. Mm. I guess there's no more to be said. You'll go through with it tomorrow night, as planned. Yes. Now remember, do not drink any coffee that's poured. I wish I could say something, Colonel Reynolds. I, I feel for you from the bottom of my heart. But this is bigger than you, or me. I know. But still, I think she's innocent. Some more champagne, Avery? Please, John. That's a stunning evening gown. It blends right with your skin. Oh, <laughs> flatter. Some more champagne for you, sir. Yes. Uh, and Martin. Uh, yes, sir. Miss Avery and I will have our brandy and coffee in the library tonight. Yes, sir. And I'd like to have you remain this evening. Very good, sir. Oh, uh, by the way, Avery, did you ever know William R. Terrace? Terrace? Oh, uh, wasn't he the man who committed suicide about four months ago? Yes. I've seen him, but um, I've never met him. Oh, awful thing, wasn't it? Hmm. I've heard some people say it, uh, it wasn't suicide. Yes, but you can't tell from rumors. Oh, like the silverware? Oh, <laughs> you caught me looking at it, John. Yes, I do like it. Everything about this place, it's, uh, it's so tasteful. I had thought I was perfectly contented. But now it all seems so insignificant. To have something really worthwhile, you've got to have someone to share it with. I found the same thing true, John. Closeness and comradeship mean more than anything. Uh, shall I have Martin serve the coffee and brandy in the library? Yes, do I finish? Yeah, let me help you. But I'd rather sit on the divan with you. Avery, you look like the most sophisticated woman in the world. Like one of those gorgeous paintings. And then you say something so tender. Oh, but a woman should be a mystery to a man. Oh, there. Avery. I know. But you don't know how much. Yes, I do, John. My heart's pitter-pattering the same way. It has been... Ever since that last trip. Do you love me, Avery? Yes, John. Very deeply. Avery. Um, oh. <laughs> uh, pardon me, sir, but uh, Mr. Harding and his friend have called. Oh, uh, yes. Yes, Martin, show them in. Oh. Certainly, sir. Why did they have to come at just this moment? Well, Harding's a very good friend, I guess. He's just dropping in. No, we were just on our way to the club. We thought we'd stop in, Colonel. Hello, Harding. Glad to see you. Have you met Miss Rollins? I don't believe I've had that privilege. Good evening, Miss Rollins. Good evening, Mr. Harding. Well, Miss Rollins is a friend of mine, Mr. Mark. 
Good evening, Mr. Mark. It's a pleasure. And Colonel Reynolds, Mark. Good evening, Mr. Mark. Won't you join us in the brand-in coffee? No, thank you. We've just finished dinner. Mm, sit down, gentlemen, and make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. Well, while you men chat, I think I'll go and freshen up a bit. We just finished dinner. A delicious dinner, Mr. Harding, but fried chicken, and you know what that does to the hand. <laughs> well, I've always maintained the only real place to really enjoy fried chicken was in the bath. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you men chat, and I'll be back in just a few moments, if you'll excuse me. Harding, it's all right to talk in front of Mr. Mark? Yes, Colonel. He's a counter spy in active service. Harding, it can't be true. She's too decent. I'm going crazy. Oh, Colonel Reynolds, I'm going to have to be brutal tonight. Ordinarily, I wouldn't operate this way. But I'm going to do everything I can to expose this right here in front of you. I believe I owe it to you. Tell me, Harding, she's really one of your agents working with you. Tell me that you suspected me and really did this so she could check on me. Tell me that. He's my mind. The only way, Colonel, is to let this unfold. Now, would you ring for your butler, please? Why, yes. Yes. Harding, is it the butler you're really after? Tell me it's he and not Avery, isn't it? Colonel, I know how upset you are. I sympathize. But I can't change the facts. Now, don't say anything for a minute. Did you ring for me, sir? I believe the colonel wanted you to pour some brandy for me. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. This is a gun in your stomach. Don't move. Harding. Quiet, please, Colonel. Cuff his hands behind him, Mark. Tight. I've, I've got him. Then he's the man you're after, not Avery. I believe he... Are you smart? There. Without his wig, he looks more natural, like his picture. Your butler, Colonel Reynolds, is Herr Franz Beckmann, one of the cleverest Austrian spies. I am not him. I do not know whom you are talking about. Colonel, when your butler was hurt by a car six weeks ago, you might be interested to know it was a plot. The man at the wheel of the car which ran down your butler was this man standing here. He wanted to pose as a butler so he could get in your house here. We've been checking on him for weeks. Here. Drink the coffee you served the colonel. Drink it. Now, you don't like doped coffee, eh, huh, Bergman? Please, Harding Avery is coming back. Watch her when she comes in. I think she'll be pretty surprised. Is something the matter in here? Well, is that your butler? His hair is... Yes, Miss Rollins. We removed his wig. Why? Well, for the reason that he happens not to be a butler. But Herr Franz Berkman, a very noted Austrian spy. A spy? He's a spy? Yes. Quite a catch. Oh, I'm so glad you caught him. Mark, take Berkman over to the other side of the room. Come on, Hitler. Or I'll lead you by the nose. Oh, John, you must feel terribly about this taking place in your apartment. Here, take this brandy. You look like a ghost. Thank you. Thank you, Avery. Thanks. Now, Colonel Reynolds, I have a record I'd like to play for you. Would you mind my using your machine? Why, no. No, the switch is right on the side of the radio. Right. It's just a short recording. I, uh... I feel a little dizzy. I guess I'll sit here by you, Avery. Good. What kind of a record is it, Mr. Harding? What's the purpose of it? Well, I believe that it'll be self-explanatory. It was made last night. There. The lines were spoken rather softly at the time, but I'll turn on the full volume so we won't miss anything. Yeah. Quick, get the camera ready. Oh, I can't find anything but personal paper. Oh, they must be there. The colonel told me himself. He kept them in the wall safe in his library. Yes, that's all right, but if we don't find them, you'll just have to keep on playing him. Oh, that old fool. I want to spit in his face every time I get near him. I can't stand to touch him. Gosh, you... Oh, the plans are not here. Yeah, he has failed. But they must be there. Uh, we have failed tonight. <laughs> but he'll probably put them in here tomorrow. I hope tonight would be the last. Then I could break him and force him to commit suicide like terrorists. If he won't, we'll poison his coffee. Oh, not so you quick. You dog, it's vermin. I'll spit at you. I'll kill you. Avery, do you know what you're saying? You pig, you swine. Let go of me. Fortunately, Colonel Reynolds, the plans weren't there. But if they had been, you wouldn't be alive tonight. She'd have worked on you till she'd gotten you to commit suicide. No, and I would have made him kill himself just like I made Carol kill him. Shut up, you fool. Don't talk. Yeah, she'd have told you she'd gotten the plans, that you'd be disgraced. She'd have broken your heart. You'd have done what all the other men have done she's worked on. And I'd have laughed at the stupid dog. Colonel, her real name is Marie Schmitz of Hungary, a paid spy. She goes to the biggest bidder. This woman is one of the cleverest, if not the cleverest, paid woman spy in this country. And that butler of yours, Franz Berkman, is her husband. Take them away, Mark. The other agents are out in the front hall. Yes, sir. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Now, come on, come on. I'm sorry, Colonel. 
But I had to strip it all down before you, so you'd never have any doubt. I didn't know. A person could be hurt quite this much. You may have saved the lives, Colonel, of thousands of our boys. I hope so. Come over here by the window for a minute. Would you, Colonel? Why couldn't she have been what I hoped she was? Look at those Marines swing along. You've done them and the boys like them a great service, Colonel Reynolds. No one will probably ever know about it. But you will. And I will. Let's open the window. Doesn't that send a thrill through you? It does. Yes. I'm glad I was able to help Harding. Every one of us has got to sacrifice some one way, some another. I guess this way is mine. All over this country tonight is spread a great army of counter spies, men working to protect you and our boys at the front. Special agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, of the Secret Service, of the Treasury and State Departments, of the Intelligence Bureaus of the Army and the Navy. Men who are constantly on the alert, diligently protecting our home front. These men beg of you not to talk concerning troop movements, armaments, defense plants, and wartime plans. There are many leeches, enemy agents, just waiting to pounce on every little scrap of information so their experts can piece it together into a big, compact picture of our war efforts. Next Monday evening, counter-spy David Harding will be on the air. Tell your friends, invite them to listen in to these exciting, dramatized cases portrayed weekly at this time. Counter Spy is a Phillips H. Lord production which has originated from New York. This is the Blue Network. Harding, Counter Spy, calling Washington. Harding, Counter Spy, calling Washington. The Blue Network presents Phillips H. Lord's Counter Spy. A counter spy is a United States undercover agent whose duty it is to smash the professional enemy spies operating in our midst. Imagine the ace counter spy of them all as David Hardy. Those are the footsteps of Liza Gott as she walks along the narrow, rocky path which runs on top of a high cliff, looking out over the sea on the northern coast of Maine. <coughs> Forty-two years ago, Liza got married. Mark got her husband, sailed away, and was drowned. For 41 years, Liza got has kept a little kerosene lantern lit on her front porch, so just in case Mark should return, he'd see the lighted lantern from the sea and know she was waiting. <clears throat> well, well. <sighs> Liza Gott is nearing her little house on the top of the cliff where she stays alone. Liza sees something, something on her front porch. She can see it by the light of the lantern. Hmm. 
<laughs> That's funny. I didn't leave nothing on the front porch. It looks like a man. It is a man. What are you doing on my front porch? Oh. Wake up. Oh. I said, what you doing lying on my front porch? Oh, I, I was just lying here. I'm exhausted. Guess I fell asleep. You're a stranger. Yes. I've had a narrow escape. I landed here in a lifeboat. Saw your lantern lit, so I came up here. When I found nobody was in, I was too tired to go anywhere else. What happened to you? Uh, I was in a small Norwegian lumber schooner. There were five of us. Just off the horseshoe reefs, we were torpedoed. I got the lifeboat over alone. The others were killed in the blast. I was way after. I'd have been killed, too. One of those terrible German or Japanese submarines? Yes, it happened yesterday morning. I've been rowing for land ever since. Then I heard a bellboy. And about an hour later, I landed on the beach, down there. Hmm. You've had a terrible time, ain't you? Could you give me a little food? Let me stay here tonight? Uh, come in. Uh, you've got to be took care of. Thank you. I'll have to light up a light. Shall I bring in the lantern? No, sir. That lantern stays there lit under all conditions. And it ain't never going out nor being took in. So long as I'm conscious. There. Now you can see. I'm sorry to trouble you. It ain't no trouble at all. Uh, may I inquire your name? Liza got. And it's got two T's and no E before the L. Liza, not Eliza. What's your name? Uh, Berkman. Frank Berkman. Mm. You look pretty tuckered. Here. Now just lie down here on this sofa and make yourself comfortable. Oh, I have been through a good deal. Well, now you, you stretch right out. Uh, yeah, put, put, put your head up here. Uh, and your feet down there. Now, uh, are you quite sure you're comfortable? Oh, I never was more comfortable in my life. Well, that's good. There. Now you can rest in peace. Danny, this is Liza. Get me quick as you can, the counter-spy headquarters in Washington. And I want to speak to the head of it, no young Stripling. You gone, Daffy? Do as I tell you, Fanny. Get me the head of the counter-spies. Well, mm, I still think you're Daffy, but I'll ring him. Fanny, ain't you got Washington yet? Yeah, we got counter-spy headquarters, but... They're getting ahead of it. I said it was a calamity. Hello. This is Harding speaking. This is Liza Gott, a Loganberry Point, Maine. I've caught me a spy. Uh, pardon me. Uh, would you say that again? I'm Liza Gott, a Loganberry Point, Maine. And I've caught me a spy. Well, uh, naturally, I'm a little dumbfounded. Uh, where is he? Well, lying on the sofa over there. But if he hears you, why doesn't he get up? What? You ain't see the condition he's in. Is he unconscious? Very. How do you know he's a spy? Well, he told me about Rowan alone. And hearing our bellboy at the Narrows. And then Rowan an hour and landing on our beach. Well, I was born here. And I know this coast. And there ain't nobody rowing from the bellboy at the reef to this shore on an ebb tide in one hour. He's a, a prevaricator. What is Loganbury Point near? Ain't near nothing. The nearest place is Stuyvesant. Well, well, that ain't near nothing either. 
Well, this is very unusual. But I'll leave my plane immediately. Get to Loganberry Point somehow. Very nice of you, Captain Stinson, to drive me over to Loganberry Point. The plane couldn't seem to find a nearer landing place. No? Uh, you don't suppose, do you, Captain, that the horse might trot a little? I'm not much worried about it. <laughs> no. I mean, could you make her trot? No. I put her out to pasture when she was 22. She's been out there eight years now. I had to call her back into harness when the gas ration went in. She has enough trouble to stand up. I say nothing, I trot him. I see. Do you happen to know Eliza God over at Loganbury Point, Captain Susan? Yep. Is she quite a responsible person? Short of the earth. I just thought I'd visit her. You mean room there? Yes. You don't know Eliza. What do you mean? You'll find out when you get there. Come right in, Mr. Hardin. Thank you, Mrs. Gutt. I took a plane as far as Syverson and then had to drive over. Now, where is this man you captured? In the woodshed. Woodshed? That's where he is. No man but my past husband ever spent a night under this roof. And there ain't no man ever going to. Uh, uh, don't you want to put down your suitcase? Oh, no, no, thank you. I have some equipment in it. Oh. Now, you'll have to go the rest of the way yourself. He's right in there, laid out on a cord of wood. I ain't going into no woodshed with no two men. All right, Mrs. Gott. I'll go look. <laughs> sort of the worst for wear. Come on. Uh, Here, come on. Uh, go away. Go away. Now, come on, sit up. Yeah, sit up. Oh. Oh, it's you. Are you the man she'd been waiting for? Yes. Then get me out of here. I had to pretend I was unconscious, or she'd have killed me. What do you mean? After she dragged me out of here, she'd come out every hour. And if I was conscious, she'd hit me over the head with that piece of stove wood. Knock me out. Look at my head. I can't tell how much of it is your head and how much is bumped on top of your head. <laughs> she'd hit me over the head, just as cool and systematic as though she were a pile driver. Let me have your fingers. I want to take your prints. No. You'd better, or I might call Mrs. Gott back. Oh, that's better. I'll telephone your prints to Washington. We'll see who you really are. G6, Countess by Headquarters, Washington, reporting to Harding. The fingerprints you just telephoned in are prints of Dr. Slesson, who left San Francisco for Portugal 18 months ago. He was employed in the Stillwell plants while they were experimenting on cargo-carrying hair transports. It looks like Dr. Slesson is the one we have been expecting the Gestapo to try and smuggle into the country. Come in. I'm glad to know it's Slesson that we've got... Quite obvious, Lesson has been sent in to secure all possible information on the newly contemplated cargo-carrying transport. This is a job the Gestapo probably allowed him about a week to complete. And then they must have made arrangements to get him out. I'll check with you later tonight. Well, Berkman or Slesson, you just heard that conversation. We know who you are and why you're here. I guess there isn't any sense to my denying. After all the plans... Had to bump into that woman. You're going to talk? No. I see. Well, as the people of Logan Mary Point would say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. My 
Martha. Martha, the church bell's ringing. Something's up. Put it on your hat, Martha, the one with the yellow ribbon. <laughs> The church bell's ringing, and it ain't go to meeting night. They must be calling it for something special. called to the church here at the request of Mr. Harding concerning an important matter. <coughs> I'm proud to see every person of Loganbury Point present. <coughs> Mr. Harding of Washington. Citizens of Loganbury Point, I know you're all aware of the circumstances of the German spy who landed and was apprehended here. He means cops. Yeah. Now, our government knows why he was sent here. His mission would ordinarily take him a week. It is logical to expect he would be returned to Germany by the same route he arrived. Well, this part of the coast was selected because it's very sparsely populated. The Gestapo evidently believed landing here would be very simple. By all logic, I expect arrangements have been made by the submarine to pick him up at this very place within the week. Did you ever hear All of you men present are lobster fishermen, or go out hand landing and setting trot lines. You know the reefs and shoals like your own backyard. You can weave in and out of them on the blackest nights and in the thickest fog. I'm calling for volunteers. Every night I want six fishermen to pretend that their motors have gone back on them and remain out there in their launches. Now, it's a dangerous undertaking. There's a chance you might be captured and even tortured for information. How many of you men are willing to volunteer? (laughs) This is a sight I wish every American could see. Some of you are over 80. Some in your teens. And not a man in this church who isn't standing. We are breaking water, Herr Kapitän. Making the surface. Good. Machen Sie auf. It is very foggy and dark, Herr Kapitän. We are among the reefs. I suggest you come on deck. Aufpassen. Ich komme sofort. Bleiben Sie bei den Motoren. Get a hold of it. Get the ropes around it. What's going on? What is that? Hold me that rope, or I will shoot. Then we surface. We came up right alongside that little fishing boat. There is a fisherman on it. Good. Bring him aboard. We will question him about these waters. Take him down to the control room. He looks like an old man. Get him below. Ring him up. The captain wants him below decks in the control room. Blackout ship. Jawohl, Herr Kapitän. Charge batteries. Hans Borkmann will soon be here. He smells fish all over him. Get down there, you fish. Well, what are you doing out in your boat? Late at night in the fog. I was doing me a mess of fishing. My trusted motor broke down. So? Perhaps it didn't break down. Perhaps you are out here spying. You think they'd give me an important job like that? An old seaman over 70? See, with a wooden leg. Yeah, you're right. You are too old. What's your name? Stinson. Captain Egbert R. Stinson. So you are a captain. Captain of fish, perhaps. Well, if you understand, sir, for 50 years I was captain of sailing ships. And I never lost a one. Yeah. If you are so good, where are we right now? 
In the devil of a fog, if that'll help you. You know what I mean. What's our location? How far off Horseshoe Reef are we? You're a quarter mile northeast of it. You're lying. I know it. So you dare lie. I think we can take care of that. Mate, a hot iron from the galley. But I will get the wire first, Dick. Well, I never see a room with so many gadgets in it before. We didn't need all these wires on the sailing ship. How far are we from the lighthouse? Lighthouse? Oh, let me see. As the crow flies, I think I'd say about a million miles. You talk. You will talk plenty. All right, I'll talk, you dirty vermin. The sea is clean. It's decent. Not a foul like the likes of you. Before you're through, you and this rotten hook will be at the bottom of the sea. But the fish won't trouble your carcasses. There isn't one foul enough to eat you. Curse you and all your foul kills. I'm there. Sit on that fire axe. I'll kill you. Go ahead. Shoot. Against you. Me. There. There. Keep on shooting. Keep on. I'll have it all finished before you can kill me. There. There's one thing, Mr. Borden. Hold steady for it. Kill him. What is the matter? Shoot this crazy fool. Come nearer and I'll chop your head off. There. Oh. Oh. Crazy fool. Six bullets to stop him. Have the chief engineer and electrician both cover central control at once. Ya wohl, Herr Kapitän. Chief engineer, electrician, report to central control at once. Inspect, repair damage. Ring for hand control. To we see what that maniac has done to our automatic gear. Herr Kapitän, the master air stuff is damaged. Impossible to say how long it will take to repair. Main periscope eyepiece also is broken. The depth indicator dial is completely wrecked, right, Herr Kapitän. How long will it take to repair? Two or three hours, Herr Kapitän. The compressed airline is breached. Several hours to repair. Also, main ballast hand valve jammed. For flukes, Uncle Mal. All this damage with the axe. <laughs> I need right now. I want to hang up and then use this phone. Now, let's see. I turn this little crank here. Yes, ring it long and loud. Sometimes Penny, the operator, lays down and takes naps. Now, Miss Gott, would you run down the path and ring the church bell? Emergency. Yes, If the bell rings late at night, they know they're to bring what guns they have and rush for the wharf. Hello? Oh, operator, get me that number I wrote out for you yesterday. Yes, sir. Please hurry, Mrs. Gunn. Have that church bell rung. Oh, Redeer said one if I land and two if I see. Naval control. This is Harding reporting. Relay to destroyer Smithville. Proceed at once one mile southeast of Sand Island Light. German submarine on surface. Immediately, sir. Relay to Coast Guard. Carry out plan three, if possible, and fog does not prevent. Otherwise, plan two. Immediately, sir. Include in Navy message. That because of present emergency, I'm going to try to get armed fishermen to submarine first. So if destroyer reaches submarine, watch for all clear signal, which will indicate presence of Americans on board. Yes, sir. Those of you with the slowest motorboat, start out first. Here's Sandy's gun. Some men take it. I want all of you men to understand that this is an extraordinary situation. You're all volunteering on your own accord. They all want to go. Now, the reason we're taking things in our own hands is because it's so foggy the planes can't spot the sub. It is too foggy for the destroyer to come in among these reefs until daybreak. Indications are that something's happened to that submarine, and it can't submerge. 
Would you say, Captain Lawson, that there was a very heavy swell out there near Horseshoe Ledge? Plenty heavy. After a three-day nor'easter, they've got a rule out there that's standing them on their heads. Well, that means the fire from the submarine will be very inaccurate. Now, when we sight her, you're all to fan out and make a circle around her. When you hear Captain Lawson blow his foghorn twice, head right for her. Start shooting and picking off the men manning the guns. With 30 launches coming at her in all directions and the fog and the heavy roll of the sea, she'll have her hands full. We'll all board her at the same time from all sides of her. Left ball is starting out. All right, men, your launches. Good luck. And remember, your women folks will be standing right here and await. That's her, Captain Lawson. A dark shape, about two points to starboard. I am scum. Should I blow the foghorn twice? No. Twice is to attack her. Blow it once, so they'll fan out and approach her from all sides. Now slow the motor. Give the others time to get around her. I didn't realize how patriotic I'd be till I started thinking of them Burmans setting foot on our shore. I've never seen a thicker fog. She spotted us. Shall I head for her? No, she's only shooting at the sound of our motor. Who are you? Hands up, holy shoot! We won't reply. Let him stew. Who are you? Get ready, Captain Lawson, to blow your foghorn. Two blasts. <laughs> I ain't had so much fun since Lige's cow fell in the well. <laughs> All right. Found the signal. Take the wheel, will you, Mr. Harding? Let me do a little gunning. Go ahead. But the minute we touch her, jump aboard. Try to land at Loganbury Point, will they? The whole German crew's on deck. Get Mulligan close, eh? Get that crew by the aft gun there! They're falling like ten pins, Harding. Just board her! Let your own boats go so others can come along. Understand, Commander, as we stand here in the control room of your submarine, that you and all your crew are prisoners of the United States. Tja, das ist zu erwarten. Krieg schon. I am helpless. And there at your feet, an old sea captain with twelve bullet holes, evidently kicked in the face after he was dead. He was shoving at our controls with the fire axe. We had to shoot him. We shoot him six times before he fell. Captain Stinson was a neighbor of mine. What arm of the American forces have we been captured by? The fishermen of Loganberry Point. Mr. Hardy! Mr. Hardy! United States destroyer approaching out of the foster! How in Sam Hill did a destroyer get in among these shoals on a night like this? <laughs> That's real navigating for you. What am I supposed to do now? You're expected to surrender your submarine and your crew and yourself to the greatest navy in all the world. <laughs> His neighbors at Loganbury Point return the earthly remains of one who has lived among us for so many years. Captain Stinson, if he had had a thousand lives, he would have chosen no other way to have given them all. And so we of Loganbury Point, not mournfully, but with pride in our hearts, say goodbye to a great American who lived as an American and died as well. God bless America, the land of the free.
David Harding is presented at the same time every Monday evening. is a Philip H. Lord production which has originated in New York. This is the Blue Network. WJZ New York, which brings you fun and excitement as you listen to the Sing Patrol program at 77 on your dial every Tuesday night at 8.30. Washington calling Counter Spy. Washington calling Counter Spy. Calling Counter Spy. Washington calling Counter Spy. Washington calling Counter Spy. Children. 
Ever since I've been married, I've been going to church. Once a month. Now, I don't like the funny things that's going on here. Uh, I just want my pay. Place for years, Sam. Before you started working for us, there were two other men working here. They wanted to quit. That was the last time they was ever heard of. Yes, uh, I knows about that, too. They done work here, and then they go away, and nobody near me and nothing about them. I want to quit. But we don't want you to quit. And you're not going to quit. I'm sorry, sir, but my mind's made up. Uh, stop for a while, Tony. I'll come straight. Hey, you listen. I know Dan M. Waters is a lot of alligators and less than 20 feet from you to the sharks come in. You don't want to quit, do you? I does. I was a man with 14 children. When I make up my mind, it's made up. If you had 14 children, you'd know that when you make up your mind and say something, there ain't no one me. Now, you listen for the last time. If you don't want to be shot, Faith, you'd change your mind, understand? Yes, yeah, sir. Are you staying or leaving? I was leaving, sir. I was telling you, I was a man with 14 children. Well, Butch, looks like we got to find a new handyman. Yeah, yeah, but come on, let's drag him out. we get enough of that wind blowing in that storm. I don't want to have any corpses laying around here. Yeah. Grab his feet. Okay. Yeah, I got him. Yeah. Yeah, drag him to the edge. The tide's going out. He'll be out in deep water in an hour. Yeah, come on, let's get back to our card game. You know, I was just going to go jump. Mr. Harding, I, I took the liberty of bringing Miss Bixby along with me. 
Good. Good. How do you do, Mr. Bigby? Good evening, Mr. Harding. Back, sir. Those counterfeit coupons I gave you to analyze, were they all printed on the same counterfeiting plate? They were, Mr. Harding. Yeah? What can you tell me about the kind of plate the counterfeiter used? Well, the printing was probably done on a vertical press plate, sir. I see. I took the liberty of passing these counterfeited gasoline coupons on to Mr. Bixby for ink analysis. He has some very interesting reports. Good. What is your ink analysis of these counterfeit gasoline coupons, Mr. Bixby? Well, Mr. Harding, analysis shows the ink was compounded of hydrochloric solutions of gallic and tannic iron salts with the usual sugar and gum marrow mix present. Applying a reagent of 3% oxalic acid made the counterfeited ink disappear. Well, the Negro Cynic ink of the genuine coupons was unaltered. Uh, how many concerns manufacture this certain type of ink, Mr. Bixby? Three. One is a very small one and sells almost entirely in northern New England. Mr. Bixby, cover all of the ink manufacturers who use this compound of hydrochloric solution of gallic and tannic iron salts in their ink. Yes, sir. Take all of their shipments over the past nine months. Give me the address of every shipment that they've made. Yes, sir. Harding speaking. Get me commander, Army Base Airfield. Bud, pack your suitcase and meet me at 11 tonight at the base airfield. Yes, sir. Cold for a warm climate or a cold, Mr. Harding? Hot. Well, Mr. Harding, now that the rush is over somewhat, where are we flying to? The Florida Everglades, Bud. We land at Miami and proceed south by car. What did you find out from those statistical reports? Well, our statistical department has reported, Bud, that a number of shipments of gasoline have been made by six different companies to a certain gasoline launch supply station along the main road in the Everglades. We also found out that a certain shipment of Willis and paper was also sent to this gasoline station. You probably recall the forged coupons were printed on Willis and paper. Yes. And also ink, similar to that used on the counterfeited coupons, was also shipped to this gasoline station. Hey, that's hot. Exactly what kind of a filling station is it, Mr. Hardy? Well, are you familiar with the Everglades, bud? No, no, I'm not, sir. There was one main road, which has been built up on artificial ground and piling. Run for nearly 120 miles across the peninsula. Goes over about 40 different little islands. On a few of these are gasoline stations. This gasoline station in question is just about 100 feet off the main road. It services automobiles and also fishing boats. Yes, but how can it service any enemy submarine? People are driving over that road constantly. There must be dumb neighbors down there. That's the catch. That's what you and I've got to find out, but yeah. If anything wrong is going on down there, a mighty clever device is being used. What's your plan, sir? Well, in the morning, we'll land at Miami. We'll get an oil truck, fill it full of gasoline, and find out when a delivery is supposed to be made to this gasoline station. Then you and I will make the delivery. Quick time. Yeah, we 
Except for all this Miami. Man, it sure is dark out here. I'll have to use my flashlight. Now, where do we put this gas, huh? We got a tank under the dock. That's the pipeline to your left. Okay. Do well, I need a drink? Now you can unscrew the cap with your hand. Yeah, okay, bud. Let's have a hold. Coming up. Come on, rubber hose. Okay, bud. Let the gas come full. Here she runs. Oh, into the tank of fill. Do you want a drink, mister? Sure. Not supposed to touch it while I'm on duty, but I guess the little one wouldn't hide now. Here's a bottle. Help yourself. Thanks. In fact, I only carry two bottles. One for a friend, one for myself. So I'll take a little nip out of mine. Here's to you. Here's to you guys. No, oh, I blast that what a lumbering fool I am. What'd you do? Drop your bottle? Yeah, and worse luck it hit on the top of this iron stanchion and bust it. Yeah. I have to have a nip out of this other bottle then. Yeah. Man, I don't feel any standard living down here. Nobody for five miles on either side of you. Oh, uh, yeah? Got a spin. What's that? Alligator. Just one of the neighbors. Harding calling J-8, Palm Beach, Florida. You get contact. Harding calling J-8, Palm Beach. Coming through. Notify all counter spies on Florida East and West Coast to investigate all ocean-going tugs. Check the last five or six feet of their rope hawsers. I broke a bottle of nitric acid on iron stanchion, which bore marks of a rope hawser having been tied to it. This acid will burn hemp fibers of hawser. Notify immediately of any tug having hawser burned at end. J-8, reporting to Harding, Miami counter spy field headquarters. Tugboat, Santa Louise, out of Cape City, has hawser showing acid burn. Good. Contact me immediately as soon as that tug leaves and returns to her home berth. Want exact times of leaving and return. J-8, counters by reporting to Hardy. Proceed. Tugboat, Santa Louise, left berth 735 last night. Return 535 this morning. Average speed when not towing is 14 miles. That is all. All right, bud. This is the information we've been waiting for. Now, let's look at this chart of the west coast of Florida and do a little figuring. Yes, sir. Now, the Anna Louise's home port is 23 miles from this gasoline station in question. She cruises at 14 miles an hour. That'd take her... One hour and 45 minutes to get from her home to the gasoline station. Correct. One hour and 45 minutes for her to return from the gasoline station back to her home berth. The entire time being three hours and a half. But she was gone ten hours. That leaves six and a half hours of her time to be accounted for. That's right. Six and one half hours. Now... Suppose she hooked onto a 10,000-gallon barge at the gasoline station in question and towed it out to sea to meet a submarine. It would take two hours to unload the 10,000 gallons after she met the sub. Which leaves two and a half hours for her to tow the loaded barge out and the empty barge back. Correct right again. Now, I checked with the Navy, and a tug which makes 14 miles an hour by itself is slowed to 12 miles an hour when she's towing an empty barge. Now, when she's towing a loaded barge of 10,000 gallons, she'd be slowed to 8 miles an hour. Her average is therefore be 10 miles an hour. Two and one half hours still accounted for. That means in two and one half hours, the sub could cover 25 miles. So she'd be meeting a sub 12 and one half miles off the southern Florida coast. That's beautiful deduction, Mr. Harding. Good reasoning, but where does it get us? What makes you think she did pick up a 10,000-gallon barge at the gasoline station in question? Where was the barge? Oh, but I haven't been entirely honest with you. I kind of suspected it. Did you notice, Bud, the night when I put the nozzle of the gasoline hose into that pipe, the pipe was just flush with the duct? No, I didn't. Well, it took us 45 minutes to put that gas in. When I took the nozzle out of the pipe, the pipe was four inches lower than the level of the duct. Oh. Then the tank under the duct was a floating tank that went up and down with the tide. The duck was really a disguised oil barge with just the shell of a duck over it to camouflage it. Exactly. And before morning, the tug brings the empty barge back and it's shoved under the dock again. What's our next move? Tap out the signal through the counter spy headquarters, Washington. 
have the contact relay to our field testing laboratory and get me Tex Walker. Tex is an expert chemist on gasoline and all fuel oils. The next time a submarine's refueled with that gasoline, they're going to have a surprise coming to them. Sorry, sir. We're having trouble with the motor. Oh, what's the matter? One motor has stopped entirely. We have started taking it apart. The whole inside is burned as if there were acid in the gasoline. That cannot be. How long will it take to repair? I'm afraid, sir, it is beyond repair. And the other motor is giving us trouble. The stout is for tears. Do not, idiot. Put on the light. Switch on the lights, you fool. Sir, we are having the same trouble with our gasoline generators. Switch the car into the battery. You must repair them. We'll be at the mercy of the Americans. Are you sure it's trouble from the gasoline? Yes, sir. The carburetor and filters in the gasoline line have all been eaten away by acid. Do my luda. Notify her him at once. Tell him we're ruined. We've been sabotaged. Notify her Teachman in New York. It's his fault. Coughlin's loads of doom cup. He will suffer. <laughs> Headquarters, Washington. Emergency message just intercepted from disabled German submarine off Florida coast to Herr Himmler, Berlin. Submarine also trying to contact Gestapo agent in this country, but cannot as yet locate contact point. That means a Gestapo agent will be sent to the Everglades to investigate trouble. Notify Florida police to proceed on observation plan 3B. <laughs> Police reporting to David Harding according to issued Countess by orders. Black limousine speeding down Everglades Trail at 70 miles an hour. Drivers alone in car. Out of state car. License number New York 14C319. Shall we stop this car at next police intersection? No. Let us proceed. Washington, do you contact Baxter? Pete? Yes, sir. I'm in the New York License Bureau as you requested. Your call is being relayed directly to me. This is Harding. I'm still in Miami. Check for me immediately. New York license, 14C319. Yes, sir. I have the files. Just a minute. 14C319. Uh, Herbert R. Teachman, 1142 East Riverside Drive. Teachman, Teachman. That name's very familiar. I'm having our suspect filing clerk listen in to our conversation. He's probably even now checking on Teachman, and you should hear from him within the next two minutes. Excellent, Baxter. I'll use your head. I'll wait right here for his report. Suspect filing clerk, if you're listening on this wavelength, come in as soon as possible. Time's an important element. Bill Harding, Miami Countess by headquarters. Come in. Herbert R. Teachman, wealthy broker, German-born, has lived past six years in Berlin, returned to state August 24, 1940. Bachelor, sworn in Gestapo at Hamburg, 1937. Expert... That's enough, Frank. Signing off. Okay, bud. Now we know what we're up against. It's the big boss himself. Teachman's on his way to check his operators at that gasoline station. We've got to fly down there and quick. <laughs> Take a good look at Tony. He's dead. Take a good look at a corpse. 
Because that is what you are going to be right now. Oh, oh, no, please, please take it easy. Please. I don't know that I have ever done anything that has given me more pleasure. <laughs> don't you need that boy? Please, please don't. What a fool, the swine owner. It's food for alligators and sharks. And they are going to get you. I wouldn't. And I wouldn't reach for that gun on the table, Teachman. For you. Harding, Chief of United States Counter Spies. If you make one move, you won't have to worry about the Gestapo getting you. You'll be just as dead as those two countrymen of yours you just killed. Don't shoot. I won't move. Put your hands up in the air, Deachman. A little higher. Just as high as you can get them. So you were the one who was putting acid to gasoline. I was just one, Deachman. One of 5,000 counter spies taking every move your Gestapo made. Don't shoot. I do exactly what you say. You just want me to move so you can kill me right now. But I am not going to give you the chance. I do exactly what you want. All right, Deachman, start for the door. But be careful that your two countrymen don't trip you again. again at this same time on Monday evening. Tell your friends. Make it a date. Next week, the case of the murdered chemist. Brother versus brother. Death in the laboratory. The corpse that came to life. The mystery of the strange makeup. The secret of the powdered hair. Next week, ripping counter spy. Washington calling counter spy. Washington calling counter spy. Washington calling counter spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. Harding. Counter spy calling Washington. Phillips H. Lord's Counter Spy. Blue Network is proud to present Phillips H. Lord's Counter Spy, a dramatization packed with thrills and adventure. The fascinating portrayal of undercover agents working against enemy spies within our borders. All over this great country tonight is an invisible army of men and women highly trained to protect us from professional enemy spies within our borders. Imagine chief counter-spy of them all as David Harding. In Pittsburgh, Henry Hughes, cultured, well-educated, and sophisticated, entered his hotel suite on the seventh floor. Seated before a dressing table in the bedroom was his most attractive wife. Hello, Laura. Fixing up a little? You're late, Henry. Oh, uh, some matters down at the office. I guess I'll send for a drink. Want one? 
already had one. Oh, having a drink alone, eh? Perhaps you weren't alone. You swine! You insinuating pig! You come in with that saintly way you have, and I know where you've been. At the office, yes, the office, with lipstick all over your collar, night after night! Coming in thinking I don't know, you think I'm a fool! Stop it, you little hellion! Hellion! I gave up everything for you! Decent family, money, position, honor! I followed you every place you've gone for ten years, you sham, you fake! Traitor! What's that, Laura? Oh. Oh. Oh, I... Can't cry. I can't even do that anymore. Oh, why do I love you so? I was a kid. You've been great. Sure, sure, I've been seeing someone else. But you know, it's business. Now, as soon as I get all the information I'm after, we can leave this country. We'll be rich the rest of our lives. Now, I can't tell you the things I'm doing. I'm not allowed to. The Gestapo would kill me. But they promise that if I make good on this job, it means a big job over there. We'll get out of this country. But this is my country, Henry. Can't you see what I've been through for years? Loving you. Ready to die for you. For cheating all the time on my country. Which means more to you? Your country? Or me? You. There. That sounds more natural. Well, Laura, I've got to go out for a while of night. Now, you go to a movie or something. I'll be back as soon as I can. Where are you going? I've got to drive over the mountain to Connorsville. It's uh, about 90 miles. You lie. You're lying like you always do. You're going with her. You're letting me down. I can see it in your eyes. Well, you can't. You won't. Now, wait a minute. Okay. Okay, come along. I'll prove it to you. You mean... You mean... You want me to go with you? Yes, I'll prove to you that it's business. We'll have some drinks, drive over and make a good time of it. You mean it, Henry? I'd rather have you with me than anyone else. Oh, I'm such a fool. But I do love you so. <laughs> A bottle, Laura. Have yourself another drink. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful tonight. Look, Henry, you can see for miles. Sure. We're about 4,000 feet up. Look. Look how those cliffs drop right down from the side of the road. What's the matter? Oh, I thought I'd turn and drive right up to the edge. We can sit for a few minutes and look out at the view. Henry. The front wheels are right on the edge, both of them. Of course. See how I can handle a car? I didn't have a drink like you did. Uh, it's exciting. Have another drink. <laughs> All right, but I'm dizzy now. Yeah. Lean on my shoulder. Henry. I'm sorry. Oh! Oh, quick! What's the matter? Oh! Oh, it looks all right now, but something, something like oh, arm, like a needle. Oh, perhaps there was a pin or something in the cushion. Oh, it felt like a... Henry. Henry. Yes? What stuck into me? What was it? Why, how should I know? You do know. It was you. You've done it. There was a hypodermic needle. You poisoned me. You had... We're getting too dangerous to have around you and your jealous streak. Help! Tell your head off. Nobody will ever hear you up here. You're going over the cliff. They'll get you for this. They'll get you for me. No, oh, no. The injection was just enough to make you unconscious. When they find your body, it will have bled naturally. An accident. Your stomach full of liquor. Henry. 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 Now. The 
emergency brake. Happy journey, my dear. Now to get the front wheels over. Now the back wheels over. Speaking. J7, Pittsburgh. I think you should fly here immediately, Mr. Harding. What's your report? Very attractive wife of a Henry Hughes. Drove car while intoxicated off Mountain Cliff. Henry Hughes holds a rather important position in the Pittsburgh Bronze Casting Company, which is now doing war work exclusively. Mm hmm? What's the catch? She's supposed to have driven off the cliff while intoxicated, but the ignition wasn't turned on. The key was in the lock, turned off. Hmm. Quite remarkable. In defense work, huh? Have a complete report ready. I'm flying immediately. Pittsburgh. Check. Come in. I just had a thought. Check on the bookkeeper of the Pittsburgh Bronze Casting Company. Find out everything about him. We'll arrive in about an hour. Now, these reports, Mr. Harding, they're all on Henry Hughes. Oh, you did well to get them this quickly. Notice this, sir. Very well help it. As a matter of two years there. There seems to be no record of Henry Hughes at all during that period. You take passport files? Yes, Mr. Harding. If Hughes left the country and re-entered, he did so without leaving any record of it. Yeah. Well, there isn't a thing here that points suspicion in any way to Henry Hughes. Uh, what about the bookkeeper of the bronze casting company? Uh, Elmer Bruce, 65... Small of stature, light hair, blue eyes. Yeah. Lives with wife, both regular church attenders. She's a Sunday school teacher. They have a daughter and two sons, one grandchild. Mm -hmm. Bruce is very well thought of by his neighbors. He's a great lover of books. Goes to the library at least four nights a week. Well, the library, huh? Quite a scholarly chap. I think I'll drop over to the library and see if Bruce happens to be there. me, uh, were you through with this book? Oh, oh, yes, 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 I was just browsing through it. Uh, won't you sit down a moment? I'd like to speak to you. Why, yes, certainly. Aren't you Elmer Bruce? Why, why, that's the most amazing thing I've ever heard of. I, I've never seen you before. Well, this meeting isn't quite as accidental as it might seem, Mr. Bruce. For certain reasons, I didn't want to go to your home. Uh, I'd like to have you look at my credentials. Mercy. Oh, there's nothing to be nervous about. Well, have I done something wrong? I, uh, I just wanted to ask you a question, Mr. Bruce. Do you happen to know a man who works for your company by the name of Henry Hughes? Why, yes. Oh, wasn't that a catastrophe, his wife's death? Yes, a terrible thing. Mr. Bruce. Of course, you pay all the employees of the Bronze Casting Company by check. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, 462, uh, counting the two janitors and night watchmen. Uh, that is the last count was that. Just, I see. Uh, uh, Mr. Bruce, tomorrow your accountants are going to call on you. And Mr. Harold Lawrence, the president of your firm. Oh, yes. 
Now, these accountants are going to recommend that you pay the employees from now on in cash instead of by check. Oh, no. I want you to fall in with the accountant's plan to pay from now on in cash. But, but I, I couldn't. I'd be untruthful. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Bruce, but these happen to be government orders. A great deal depends upon them. Well, I'm sorry, too, Mr. Harding. I respect my government, but even for it, I... I couldn't lie. Mr. Bruce, it's very refreshing to meet a man of your principles. I, I, I don't wish to be an unreasonable prick. I just want to do what's right. Well, uh, couldn't you say, under the present day circumstances, you recommend paying by cash? And you wouldn't have to say, what circumstances? <laughs> well, that's rather delicately skirting the truth. <laughs> well, I might, for my country. Oh, that's fine. Now, you will receive from the bank each week some separate bills of different denominations, which we will have the numbers of. Now, you are to put these designated bills in the pay envelope each week of Henry Hughes until notified to the contrary. Oh, yes. And you're not to mention to anyone under any circumstances that you have met or talked with me. Oh, my gracious. That's a big responsibility. I hope I'm a big enough person, Mr. Hardy. After all, I've always lived in my very small way, and I'm not a broad or big person. I know all about you, Mr. Bruce. You're considered a very fine person. Thank you. Now I'll have to leave you. I'm going back to Washington. J-7 has just arrived from the Spurs by plane, Mr. Harding. Send him right in. Got any news? Quite a bit, Mr. Harding. Very interesting. Uh-huh. Now, let's see. This report covers two weeks. Yes, sir. Henry Hughes has received two pay envelopes, each containing $125. All of that money was marked, and the banks were instructed to watch for it and to make careful notes where the different bills were turned in from. You spent about eighty dollars each week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's see. He got paid Saturday. By Monday noon, the bank had received twenty dollars from the Berkshire Clothing Company, fifteen dollars from the Red Moth. Well, that's a nightclub. Thirty dollars from the hotel where Henry Hughes has his apartment. Five dollars of the money was received by the bank from a little cigar stand round the corner. He was evidently changed a bill there. Mm-hmm. Well, let's take Tuesday. A $10 bill from the gasoline station and garage where Hughes keeps his car. Uh, let me see that second week's report. I think I know what you've noticed, Mr. Harding. Let's see. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, yes, first week. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Yes, sir. Three times each week, one of those marked bills was returned to the bank from the Revolero Moving Picture House. Uh, how often does this uh, Revolero Moving Picture House change its feature pictures? Twice a week, sir. Mm-hmm. And yet Henry Hughes, shortly after his wife's death, over which he grieved greatly, goes to a certain movie house... Three times each week. Although they change the feature picture only twice a week. Yes, Mr. Harding. See that J-4 goes to Pittsburgh immediately. Gets a job as usherette in the Rebel Arrow Moving Picture House. And have her contact me for further instructions. Yes, sir. Well, this case is beginning to look pretty big, George. I have a feeling that we're going into action. We 
We'll continue tonight's case of counter-spy in just a moment. But first... Here is a message of vital importance to women and girls who want to take an active part in the war effort. Your country needs you and needs you now as a student nurse. The need is so great that 19,000 student nurses will have to enter mid-year classes in January and February. Will you be one of them? You won't attack the enemy, but you'll fight. You'll fight pain. You'll fight casualties. Even as a student, you'll release some experienced nurse to help our fighting men on the fields of battle. Here is a direct call from your country. To answer it, women and girls between 18 and 35 who are citizens and high school graduates in good health should write to Student Nurse, Box 88, New York City. That's Box 88, New York City. And they will give you full information. Now, back to Phillips H. Lord's Counter Spy. J-4 reporting to Harding from Pittsburgh. J-4 reporting from Pittsburgh. Harding speaking. Proceed. The man in question entered theater at 410, went down center aisle to row D, asked girl to remove coat from a seat, and sat down next to her. After a while, spoke to her, and from then on, they carried on conversation. This happened Monday and Wednesday. The same girl each time. Who was the girl? Phyllis Lawrence, daughter of the president of the Bronze Casting Company. What? Yes, sir. Oh. I'll contact you later. Yes, Mr. Harding. I'm leaving for Pittsburgh immediately. Tell J-7 I'm going to call on Mr. Lawrence, president of the Bronze Casting Company. Oh, pardon me, uh, Mr. Harold Lawrence at home? He is, sir. Hey, ask Chris Cody. Hmm? Kindly take him my card, if you please. Would you step in, sir? Thank you. If you wait, sir, I'll take your card to Mr. Lawrence. Certainly. Sir? I think I'll take it with me. May I take your package for you, sir? No, I'd like to keep that with me, too. Right this way, sir. Thank you, Mr. Harding. Delighted to meet you, sir. I'm very glad to meet you, Mr. Lawrence. Sit down, sit down. William should have taken your thing. Uh, well, I, I'm just stopping for a moment. Mr. Lawrence, you have a daughter. Why, yes, Phyllis. Oh, it's, uh, it's a little difficult for me to broach the subject, Mr. Lawrence, uh, but... What is it, Mr. Harding? Speak up, man. Look, are you aware, Mr. Lawrence, that your daughter is quite interested in a certain gentleman? Why, no. Phyllis has many gentleman friends. I, I don't think she's partial to anyone especially. Well, I'm afraid, Mr. Lawrence, that I must tell you that she is. Just a moment, Mr. Harding. I respect you and your position, but whether my daughter is partial to any young man or not is none of your business. Well, I don't blame you for saying that, Mr. Lawrence. And believe me, I'd never be here if it were not for a very serious purpose. What is it? Well, the young man that your daughter happens to be interested in is in the employ of our enemies, Germany. Now, let me get this straight. My daughter, you mean Phyllis? Yes. She's interested in a man who's a German spy? I'm afraid so. No, 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 you're wrong. 
Who is it? A man employed by you. Henry Hughes. Oh, no, no, Harding. Hughes? Hughes' wife, Phyllis, doesn't even know him. Besides, his wife was just killed. Why, Hughes is a fine man. I'm sorry, Mr. Lawrence, but Henry Hughes is a member of the German Gestapo. He's lying. He's lying. It isn't so. Don't you believe him, Father? Phyllis, have you been listening? Yes, and Henry isn't a spy. He's a patriotic American, just as patriotic as you are. Why, Henry? He... Henry? Henry who, Phyllis? Henry Hughes, if you've got to know. I've loved him for months, but I wouldn't see him. Then when his wife was killed, I didn't see why I shouldn't see him. He's honest, he's decent, and I'm not ashamed. I love him. Phyllis, do you know what you're saying? I can't believe... Uh, Mr. Lawrence, I'll leave. I think this is between you and your daughter. Father, this man has tried to poison your mind. Henry's fine, and you know it, and he's my sweetheart. I'll call you shortly on the phone, Mr. Lawrence. Goodbye. Phyllis, I want the truth. How long have you been seeing this man, Hughes? How do you know he isn't what Mr. Harding said he is? How do you know? I do know, and he loves me. Ask him. He didn't love his wife anyway. He told me. Ask him. I'll ask him nothing. You've been meeting him behind my back. You've been lying to me about where you were going. You haven't told me a thing about it. Well, why should I? Is it a sin to love a man? It's a sin to love an enemy. That man Harding must know what he's talking I about. I tell you, it's lies. Lies, lies, a pack of lies. I'll prove it, they're lies. <laughs> I can see under the shade. Harding's driving off in his car. Henry, that fool, that stupid ass. I'd like to have my hands on him. It's killing his wife that's led up to this. I told him not to. Uh, but he was afraid of her. She got so jealous. We've got to get out, Phyllis. Things have gotten too hot. No, it isn't all up yet. Henry's driven over the mountains tonight. The counter spies evidently haven't arrested him yet, and we can see that he doesn't talk. On his way back here, he's found with a bullet. Yes, yes. Let's get the car. They'll drive and meet him. Do you think Harding was suspicious of us? Of course not. Harding thinks you're a respectable businessman and I'm your innocent daughter led astray. He came to warn us. We'll see if we can do away with Henry before he talks. What's that? What? That package by the chair. Right there. Oh, that's where Harding was sitting. Must have been in, must have been in such a hurry he forgot it. Wait a minute. Ah, it's a short wave, sir. Oh, we tricked. Harding left that there to trick us. He's heard everything we've said. Quick, the car in the garage. Don't stop for a thing. Come on. Right. You drive. Oh, prime it. It's cold. Shut up. I'm starting this. I'm afraid it won't go. Oh. Yes, the distributor cap is missing, and I wouldn't move either one of you. Two of my agents are in the back and have you covered. Very clever. And the next time you go to a theater to meet a man, Phyllis, if you ever do, be sure and look around and see who's sitting in the seat behind you. What my daughter has done has no bearing on me. Why am I arrested? Oh, come, Mr. Lawrence. You've been operating this factory on money supplied by Berlin. You make parts for airplane motors so that your firm is close to many manufacturers and you have access to their plans. And besides... He's not your daughter. He's Fräulein Grok. Henry's responsible. The fool, he ought to be shot. That's just what he did. Killed himself when my men went to arrest him. Henry? Yes. Henry. Your father. <laughs> Be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's exciting counter spy case. But in the meantime, we wish to call your attention to the government's urgent appeal for the conservation of gas for cooking and heating. Gas must be conserved for the following reasons. It is used for fuel by many industrial plants, which are now expanded to double or triple their normal peacetime size. And it is used widely in the manufacture of armor plate, gun barrels, and similar equipment, which must be hardened or molded at extremely high temperatures. Because its flame is freer from impurities than the flame from coal or oil, gas is used almost exclusively in these processes. And gas is in itself a raw material for certain products. Synthetic rubber, for example, 
and ammonium nitrate, which is used in the manufacture of explosives. That is the why, and now here's the how, of gas conservation. Don't use the kitchen range to heat the house. If you heat with gas, keep your house below 65 degrees. Cook with a low blue flame. Use hot water sparingly. Those are directions direct from Uncle Sam. Now, they may not sound as intriguing as an assignment to track down and capture enemy spies, but the conservation of gas, practiced by millions of soldier citizens on the home front, will be echoed in cheers of victory from our fighting men, because the conservation of gas will help give them equipment and weapons they need. Next week, David Harding and Counter Spy will be back with you again at this same time for The Case of the Trailed Count, The Society Woman Who Talked Too Much, The Highball Glass Served by Waiter 37, The Man at the Zoo, The Long Underwear at the Railroad Station, and The Ultra Polite Third Degree. That's next week's unusual Counter Spy. <laughs> Eleven days till Christmas. Give the present with a future. The greatest gift of all, a share in America. Give war bonds and stamps. Washington calling counter spy. Washington calling counter spy. Harding counter spy calling Washington. Harding counter spy calling Washington. The Blue Network presents Philip H. Lord's Counter Spy. <laughs> has its Gestapo, Italy at Dobra, and Japan at Black Dragon. But matched against all of these secret enemy agents are Uncle Sam's highly trained counter spies. Visualize ace counter spy of them all as David Harding. <laughs> Washington, Brigadier General Whitcomb sat in his private office at a large oak desk. Standing in front of him was First Lieutenant John O'Brien. Lieutenant O'Brien. Yes, sir? I have another mission for you. A most important mission. Yes, General? Let's see. Uh, you've been my official messenger for seven years, correct? Nine years, sir. Nine years? Hmm. Well, Lieutenant... You've been most methodical, resourceful, and diligent. Thank you, sir. Now, this envelope contains certain very important documents. They concern changing some of our heavy artillery on the West Coast. Uh, carry it inside your uniform. Now, I want you to deliver these to the commander of the San Francisco fortifications. Deliver them right into his own hands and to no other living person. Yes, sir. Shall I fly, sir? Uh, no, I don't want to call attention to your mission in any way. Just quietly get on the train. Though so you were carrying nothing of any importance. There's a transcontinental train tonight at 10 o'clock, Lieutenant. Yes, sir, there is. All I've got to do is go back to my hotel room and cancel several engagements I had, sir. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Oh. 
This is Lieutenant O'Brien calling. No. No, I can't take you to the theater tonight. No, I'm not fooling. Oh, a new dress? Honestly, I'm awfully sorry, but I've just received instructions to leave for San Francisco. Yes, San Francisco. Oh, I'll be back in about a week, and then I'll see you every night. Doctor? Oh, going to San Francisco, Lieutenant. Uh, don't you want a berth in the sleeper? Got several vacancies. No, thank you. I get knocked it up. Ooh, San Francisco's a long way to ride in the day coach. No, I'm used to it. Is the storm delaying as much? Well, let's see. Hmm, just the midnight. Oh, well, we're about half an hour late. <sighs> Thank you. Well, Lieutenant, I hope you don't get... We can't get the lights on. Somebody's cut the wires. Go right to there. See? Why, the glass is broken out. And blood. Oh, that's where the army officer was sitting. He must have been thrown out the window. Hold on, everybody. I'm going to pull the emergency. Mrs. Harding, go ahead. We located place by tracks where Lieutenant O'Brien's body landed. There was a great deal of blood. We traced footprints from there a hundred yards to the main road. Somebody had a car parked there. There were some tread marks of car in dirt beside road. Are you making plaster casts of footprints in the car tread? Yes, sir. They'll be ready by morning, sir. Good. Stand by for further instructions. Throwing O'Brien off that train was certainly a carefully planned job, Mr. Harding. Yes, David, it was no ordinary job. The only ones who knew about those plans being sent were the higher-ups. I made every move Lieutenant O'Brien made checked carefully. This job has all the earmarks of a high-class, sophisticated plot. David, I want somebody to do some special work for me who travels in high Washington circles. Couldn't we get one of our own operators into that circle? We could. But I want somebody already there, some prominent person who wouldn't be suspected of working with us. I'm going to talk to Lady Ashton. She's helped you before. She's a social leader. And she can be trusted. <laughs> I need a woman who's fairly young, beautiful, sophisticated, worldly, who travels in Washington's higher social set. I see. Have you anyone safely in mind, Mr. Hardy? Yes. Norma Braley. She's a French refugee. She's invited everywhere. She's continental. And very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> 
You're, you're sure this is all business, Mr. Harding? She is attractive. Mm. <laughs> but if Miss Braley would be willing to work with me and follow my instructions, she could be of great help. And you wish me to give a dinner so that you may meet her? Well, in Washington here, Lady Ashton, I'm often watched very carefully. I'd like to have a meeting appear to be a chance one. How about dinner Friday? I'll see that you meet Miss Braley socially then. That'd be fine, Lady Ashton. I'll be there. Yes, but you must have some opinions on how the war is going, Mr. Harding. I know how it's going to go, Miss Braley. Uh, can we walk over to the other side of the room for a minute? Yes, certainly. You know, I think Lady Ashton gives the most entertaining evenings of any hostess in Washington. Ah, she's a very charming person. Uh, Miss Braley. Yes? I don't want to be seen talking to you too long, so I'll come right to the point. Oh, you sound very serious, Mr. Harding. You're a French refugee, Miss Braley. You fled Paris just before it fell. Your entire family is still there. Well, how did you know that? Uh, more people are investigated nowadays than they think. Uh, Miss Braley. Yes? Would you take some risks if you thought you really could be of help against our mutual enemies? Oh, I'd do anything in the world. Everything is a risk nowadays. I need someone who travels in Washington's best society. I need someone who's never been connected with counter-spying in any way. Someone of courage, insight, sophistication. Uh, you mean me? Yes. Well, I'm a very hard and difficult case right now. I need someone just like you. In fact, you. But I... <sighs> I don't think I'm qualified for such an important undertaking, Mr. Harding. I, I've never had any training. You won't need any, Miss Braley. You'll do exactly as I tell you. And you really think I can help? Very definitely. Then I'll do anything you ask. It's the least I can do. You will be in danger. The ring I refer to has just murdered one army officer. I'm not easily frightened, Mr. Harding. I went through a good deal before I escaped to the United States. Then it's agreed. Now, I believe something very important is going to break later tonight. Now, any calls I make to you must be made in such a way that they can't be traced. Now, tomorrow morning at 10.30, go to the Farnsworth Drugstore on Maple Street. Yes. There are three telephone booths there. Go into the middle booth. Make several telephone calls so you can hold the booth so no one else will be using the phone. Now, hang up the receiver at exactly 11.30. Now, I have that phone number. I'll do the same thing on the other end of town so that my call to you will be from one telephone booth to another so the call can't be traced. I'll be there, Mr. Harding, right to the second. And be sure and don't call me by name over the phone. <laughs> Hello? Who are you? I'm in a telephone booth by appointment for a call at exactly 11.30. Good. Now listen carefully. A Sir Harold Palmer arrived late last night in Washington from Ontario, Canada. We've been watching him up there for over three months. He's not really of the nobility. We believe his credentials are false, but we've not been able to make sure. Yes. Now, this is the first time that Sir Harold has left Canada. And it's so close to that event which happened on the train four nights ago, we believe there may be some connection. Now, I've arranged for Lady Ashton to give a ball on this coming Wednesday evening. Somehow it will be arranged so Sir Harold will be there. I want you to meet Sir Harold Palmer at that ball. Lady Ashton will introduce you to him. Flattering. Get to know him. I'll do my best. You have a small automatic? 
One you can carry in your purse? Yes. Keep it with you at all times. That's all for now. Sir Harold, we're so delighted to claim this evening. It's very kind of you to invite me, Lady Ashton. I, I, I just come down from Canada. I'm really quite a stranger, Morton. Sir Harold. I want you to meet a guest of mine. Miss Bailey. Oh, how do you do, Miss Bailey? Good evening, Sir Harold. I, I've been admiring Miss Bailey all evening, hoping I might have the opportunity of meeting her. There, Norma. Men gave up saying things like that to me years ago. Oh, no, they didn't, Lady Ashton. Will you, will you dance this song with me, Miss Bailey? I'd love you to have. I've been admiring your dancing. The age reporting. The gentleman in question and lady spent the evening at the theater. Later attended Crescent Club, and he has just now taken her home. Place operator seven is made on his floor at hotel. That is all. D8 reporting. The gentleman in question and lady went for a drive out of Washington. Stopped at Mayflower Club on Highway 3 for dinner and dancing. Has just returned to Washington. If gentlemen orders theater tickets for play opening Friday, she gets two in seats in fourth row, center aisle. That is all. G8 reporting. Operator 6 followed couple in question this morning. She went shopping and he accompanied her. Overheard conversations indicating they are planning to meet this evening in his hotel room. Check. You know, Sir Harold, it, it is rather unusual in this country for a young woman to go up to the hotel room with a man. And they're so engaged, or something. Is that so? Very interesting. Well, uh, uh, continuing, we had our, in our home for many years what I could call a fine collection of pastoral artists. It was outside of a museum. We very seldom went out of an evening. You know, paintings are so beautiful, landscaping of all kinds. Oh. I... Yes, I see. Am I boring you with this long dissertation or art? It was just a question. Did you yawn? Oh, no. Oh, no, most certainly not. Uh, uh, continue. Tell me more about these uh, oil paintings in Dorchester. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Harding, but I didn't know what to do. I know, but it's 2 o'clock in the morning, Norma. Come up to my hotel room and for those who might be watching me wise to the fact that you're working with me. But something terribly important has happened, Mr. Harding. What? Well, Sir Harold kept talking and talking about art so late that I asked him to order some food. And when he went into the adjoining room to telephone room service, I had a chance to look in several drawers and I found these papers. Let me see them. I had this little gun with me in my bag, but... Well, no woman would ever have to show it to Sir Harold. Here. Oh. You looked at these? Yes, they report. And they state very clearly they concern confidential information between the United States and Canada. Yes. And this one even goes so far as to mention certain fortifications. Well, then it's, it's the information you want? Not the exact information. But it very definitely shows Sir Harold is working against the interests of the United States and Canada. But you should not have come here, Norma. In fact, you shouldn't have taken these papers. Yes, but why? 
Now you've got proof against your hell. Yes, but he'll miss these papers and you'll know you've tricked him and disappear. Oh, then I haven't helped. Oh, yes, yes, you've helped. Uh, Do you suppose that someone who saw me come up here to your room? Have I caused you more trouble? Unless I miss my guess, this is a report that Sir Harold has already left. Hello? G8 reporting. Sir Harold has checked out of hotel. Has ordered car from nearest garage. Shall I replace your first? No. Too dangerous at this point. Drop his trail. Tell operator 37 to pick it up. Yes, sir. I never felt so badly in my life, Mr. Harding. I feel that I've, I, I've bungled the whole thing. Oh, don't feel that way, Norma. You just accomplished so much more than I expected, I wasn't ready for it. You're not just saying that. No. I mean it. Oh. I'd rather hear you say something like that than, than anyone else. Now, of course, the artillery plans which were stolen from Lieutenant O'Brien have already been changed. A new set of plans is being sent to California Saturday night by plane. We'll wait and see if the Gestapo makes an attempt to get those new plans Saturday night. I see. But what can I do, Mr. Harding? Uh, tomorrow night. Dress very simply. Yes. Take the bus, the Maryland bus, to the end of the line. Get off there and wait for me. Things have taken a pretty serious turn. Tomorrow night should tell us a lot. Can you tell me now where we're going? To a little farmhouse about ten miles further down the road. Well, why are we going there? Well, we have a shortwave listening set there. There's nothing near the farmhouse. The reception is excellent. And you still think I can be of help? Very definitely. Yes. But I can't tell how until we hear this shortwave broadcast tonight. See, every Tuesday and Saturday night, from 1.15 to 1.30 in the morning, there's a shortwave broadcast by a bootleg station to Germany. We've been listening in on it for several weeks. But who's doing the broadcasting? Gestapo agents. In fact, we'll both listen in tonight. Oh, I've never seen so much electrical equipment, Mr. Harding. Now, you sit down here beside me, Norma. Now, take these earphones. Yeah. I'm calling another shortwave station of our own. One of my men's operating it. 42B. 42B. Come in on 24.5 megacycles. Come in. Your signal is weak, but I can get it. Come in. Proceed according to schedule. That will be three minutes and 20 seconds. Then meet me at appointment. You get it? Exactly three minutes, 10 seconds, and we'll contact. That is all. Was that a short wave station in another farmhouse? No. Oh, it was a portable sending and receiving set in a car. That's why I didn't have too much power. Oh. Now, you don't understand German, do you, Norma? No, I don't. Then I'll interpret for you. Broadcast we should be picking up right now. Now, take these earphones. He's making contact. You'll hear him in a minute. And this radio station we're hearing is operating illegally in direct contact with the Yes. Yeah. But we've got it spotted. <laughs> He's just saying he's got some real news tonight. Of Bella 24,500, Nach Berlin. The Pläne zur Befestigungsanlagen der nordamerikanischen Westküstenverteidigung sind fangemäß gestohlen worden. Talking about the West Coast fortification papers that were stolen from it. Die beiliegenden Dokumente sind in unserem Besitz. Telling Berlin that the Gestapo have the papers, but the question is how to get them out of the country. Die Übersee-Sendungen sind schärfstens überwacht. 
Revidierte Pläne werden Sonnabend an die Westküste per Flugzeug gesandt. Now he's saying revised plans are to be sent to the West Coast this Saturday night. Who are you? Get out of here! You make a move, I'll shoot. The United States counter spy. Now get your hands up. Move away from that broadcasting microphone. But this is just an amateur sending set. Oh, yeah? Put the cuffs on him, Frank. We've already got the cuffs on your three pals. The two downstairs, the one in the other room. Take them out, boys. Remember, these four are the ones who murdered Lieutenant O'Brien. This shortwave set won't be used anymore tonight, or any other night. Well, Norma, you really heard something that time. They were really captured by your men. They certainly were. Right now, they're being taken away so fast, they don't know what's happening. Yes, but how did it happen just right then? That was the message I sent out the first thing I came into this room. We had everything set. Come on. I want to drive back and face them. Where are we going now, Dave? We've got a place where we hide people like them away for a while. A prison? A sort of a private prison. With their steel bars and escape-proof devices. That's what you mean. After that, it's the firing squad. <laughs> People in these cells, Norma, are agents of the Gestapo or the Japanese Black Dragon. Let's go into this cell now. Wait. Oh. Oh, it's horrible. These prisoners just look at us. You can see in their eyes. They, they know they're going to be shot. Oh, God. Is it? Check and see if a Sir Harold Palmer has been brought in yet. If he has, bring him to this cell. I could. Yeah. Sit down in this cart, Norma. We may have quite a little weight. Dave, how did you catch the hound? <laughs> we'll let him do the dogging when he gets here. Norma, let me tell you something. Because something very startling is about to happen. Lieutenant John O'Brien was a confidential messenger for the Army. On his last mission, he was murdered in a train while the lights were out. The window was broken, and his body thrown out. Sir Harold, be in just a minute, Mr. Harding. Oh, good. Well, Norma, we checked O'Brien's movement. Everything he did after he received those confidential instructions. O'Brien went back to his hotel room, and the only thing he did besides packing was to put in five telephone calls. Three were calls to the Army Department. One was a call to his mother... And one was a call to a girl. We traced that call. It showed in the hotel records. We immediately started investigating that girl. And it gradually showed up that her background wasn't quite what she claimed it to be. In other words, she found out that Lieutenant O'Brien was a trusted government messenger. She'd become acquainted with him and started seeing a good deal of him. And when he telephoned her on this certain night and said he was going to San Francisco, she knew it must be on important business. And as he was a confidential government messenger, she knew he'd probably have the papers with him. So she passed the word on, gave orders for the two men to board the train, and after a little while, cut the electric light wires in that car, murder O'Brien, throw his body off at a certain prearranged time. Two other men in an automobile were waiting and carried his body away because they were afraid he might have important papers on his person. Well, were those men who were running the shortwave station the ones who murdered Lieutenant O'Brien? Yes. But they received their instructions from the woman to do it. The woman was the real murderer. Did you send to me, sir? Yes. I believe you know, Miss Braley. Oh. Yes, I, I've had that privilege. To have Palmer. That's right. So hell to you, Miss Braley. What a counter spy to me. George Davis. He's a counter spy? Well, he's the Canadian you sent me to watch. He's the one I stole the papers from. And a very good job of stealing them you did, too. 
Miss Braley, you are under arrest by the United States government. Oh, no. No. No, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Take it away from her, Davis. Get it. Get it. While you were sealing the papers, Davis here was putting blank cartridges in the gun you had in your handbag. Killing comes pretty easy to you, doesn't it? You had you swine. I wasn't absolutely positive that you were the woman, Miss Braley. So we heard that broadcast tonight, and your spies passed on word about the revised fortification papers being sent to the coast Saturday night. Then I knew that you were the one we wanted. Because that was just a made-up story. And you and I were the only two in the whole world. Oh, no, what are you going to do with me? You're very unobserving. You should have noticed that this is the woman's section. And half an hour before we arrived, this very cell was reserved for you. This is the place that you're going to stay. Come on, David. What are you going to do with me? You can't do it. I'm a French refugee. Do you understand? I'm a French refugee. You're a French refugee right from Berlin. You never saw France in your life. We checked your family. They live on Connection Strasse Hamburg. You can't do that, you Spiner! American is a Spiner! He's about the most vicious spy we've taken in since the war started, Hardy. I have a feeling she's responsible for a lot of important information leaking out, David. But one thing, certain, she won't get out. <laughs> That great invisible army of undercover agents, which is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to protect this country from enemies within. Washington, calling David Harding, counter-spy. Washington, calling David Harding, counter-spy. Harding, counter-spy, calling Washington. The makers of Mail Pouch Chewing Tobacco and Kentucky Club Smoking Tobacco present... David Harding, Counter Spy. In Washington, a very prominent bachelor by the name of Harold R. Blake stood in the center of his expensive apartment. The time, 11.25 at night. A dim light burned on a small ebony side table. Mr. Blake stood there. His face was ashen white. Great beads of perspiration stood out on his forehead. Go on. Pull the trigger, you coward. You betrayed your country. Go on. Go on. Have the editor hold the press. Harold R. Blake has just committed suicide in his living room. He left a note saying it was because of ill health. Clear-cut case of suicide, Mr. Harding. A wealthy bachelor in poor health, a gun... I admit, Peters, Harold Blake probably did commit suicide. But remember this. Blake held a very critical post in our government. We're still at war, and trained enemy agents are still at work. And they're experts at making murder appear to be suicide. Then you're going to investigate? Well, I think I'll at least ask a few questions. The note Blake left said he was committing suicide because of ill health. I think I'll phone his doctor and see how bad his health really was. You would know, Dr. Wolf, if Mr. Blake was in poor health. Mr. Harding, I was shocked at Mr. Blake's suicide. From everything I know, he was in perfect health. Thank you, Doctor. That's all I wanted to know. Goodbye. Peter, 
I think I'll go over to Mr. Blake's bank and see if his finances were worrying him. No, Mr. Harding, Mr. Blake's finances were in perfect condition. He had many government bonds and securities, and I'd say he was worth close to a million dollars. Thank you. Peters, when a man commits suicide, it isn't his health and it isn't finances. Look for the woman. Exactly. That's just what I want you to do, Peters. Pick six men and turn the city of Washington inside out. But find out what woman Harold Blake paid special attention to. Mr. Harding, I've just completed that investigation. Blake was described as having a spotless reputation. Congenial, sociable, friendly, but never escorted any particular woman. All right, Peters. That ends that lead. But meet me later. I'm going to take a long chance now. This is the accounting firm which Blake employed to handle his books. Why, yes, Mr. Hardy. We have been the accountants for Mr. Blake's firm for 11 years. Uh-huh. Well, Mr. Fenton. I want you to go to Mr. Blake's office and get his office pad of appointments for the past year. Note especially on the list, lapses of time. Then compare those dates with his personal checks. I want to know what personal checks were made out during those periods of absences. It should tell us where Mr. Blake was during those absences. Mr. Harding, we went over Mr. Blake's office pad and found he was absent from his business during the past year on four different occasions. A week at each time. Good. Now, during those absences, did he make out any personal checks? Yes, he did. His first absence corresponds with a check he made out at the Saratoga Hotel, Saratoga Springs. During Mr. Blake's second absence, he made out several checks at the clubhouse, Pine Hill, South Carolina. Uh-huh. This third check, it was made out at the Hampton Towers Hotel, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh-huh. The cashing of those personal checks certainly shows where he spent his time when he was absent in his office. Thank you. This is J-16 calling Mr. Harding from Saratoga Springs. Man in question spent week here in company of woman, dark complexion, about 31, expensively dressed, unusually attractive. Full report follows. J-8, reporting Mr. Harding from Pine Hill, South Carolina. Man in question stayed here accompanied by unknown woman in early 30s, dark, very attractive, expensively dressed. Report follows. Well, this is beginning to get very interesting, Chief. Yet we still may be on a wild goose chase, Peter. We have no idea who that girl was. You may have been perfectly all right. Yes, but how can we ever find her? Well, here's a little something I dug up. Hmm? On April the 2nd, Harold Blake made out a check to the Washington Jewelry Company for $8,000. Hmm. A pretty sizable amount for a bachelor to be making out to send to a jewelry house. That's what I thought, Peter. We're going to check that jewelry house. I wonder just what Harold Blake bought with that $8,000. J-11, Mr. Harding. Mr. Blake bought a solitaire diamond ring, ten and one half carats, platinum setting. Woman's ring. No record for whom he was buying the ring. That's all. Thank you. Well, Peters, now we know Mr. Blake bought a ring for some woman. But who's the woman? Where is she? That's a tough question, Chief. Well, let's put two and two together and try to make five. An $8,000 ring. That's an expensive ring. Check all insurance companies, Peters, and see if within a few days after April the 2nd, any woman insured a ring for approximately $8,000. We're getting somewhere, Chief. Here's the insurance report. Uh-huh. April 5th, a solitaire diamond ring platinum setting was insured for $8,000 by Miss Adele Winston. Hotel Belmont, Washington. Winston, Adele Winston. Try to have a report out of here. Age, 32, height, 5'5", 
light hair, light complexion. Educated in France and Switzerland. Apparently above the coast. Hmm. But the woman seen with Harold Blake at the resort was dark. Dark hair. The only weights were approximately the same. Both apparently wealthy, both smart dressers. He did, there's something wrong about all this. Something very wrong. The problem has got to be approached from some unusual angle. Oh, you have a very beautiful apartment here, Colonel. Oh, thank you, Mr. Harding. Oh, Colonel, I'm here to make a very unusual request. You knew Harold Blake personally, didn't you? Oh, yes. Uh, was his uh, suicide a bona fide suicide, Mr. Harding? You're perfectly candid, Colonel Higgins. I don't know. And that's why I've come to you. But I need the aid of a citizen, Colonel, who has a very important governmental responsibility. Now, you're 48? That's correct. And a bachelor. A confirmed one. Well, you're a very handsome man. Oh, oh, oh come now. Yes, very fascinating to women. Oh, now, wait a minute. No, no, this is serious business, Colonel. As I understand it, when there's to be an invasion of the Pacific Islands, at the very last minute, special charts must be supplied to all freighters so they'll know the little harbors where they'll have to unload the supplies. Yes, that's correct. And naturally, months beforehand, I have lists of such harbors so those charts can be printed at the last minute. Uh -huh. That's why I'm so careful of making new acquaintances. I have a responsibility on you, Colonel. That's just why I've come to you. Do you happen to know a Miss Adele Winston? Uh, no. No, I've never happened to meet her, Mr. Harding, but she's a very gorgeous woman. Uh, anyway, she's usually surrounded by any number of admirers. Well, I'm going to arrange for you to meet her, Colonel. I'm going to ask you to make yourself just as interesting to her as possible. Oh, well, In fact, I'm going to ask you to try and make it even a constant attachment for a time. Oh, no, Harding, that's a little too much. Oh, not at all. Uh, Colonel Higgins... You could be the principal factor in possibly exposing one of the most clever spies in this country today. You don't think Adele Winston was in any way connected with Blake's suicide? You don't think she's acting as a spy? That's just what I want to find out, Colonel. Good Lord, Harding. Now, I've arranged with Lady Carlin to give a reception next Friday evening. I've given her a list of guests that she's to include. Miss Winston will be one. I'd appreciate your being another... Casually meeting her. Naturally, Harding. Under those conditions, no man could refuse. I thought you'd feel that way, Colonel. Now, after you meet her, please don't try to contact me in any way. Leave it up to me. Find out what you're doing. J-9 aboard New Orleans Limited, reporting to Mr. Harding, April 16th, 4.20 p.m. The colonel in question boarded train at Washington. Hour later, joined woman on train. Dark complexion, expensively dressed. Very beautiful and exotic. Weight about 110 pounds. Tickets read Atlanta, Georgia. It is who is meeting Colonel Higgins on these trips? Is it Adele Winston or who is it? Well, Mr. Harding, I've got the facts on that girl who's been meeting Colonel Higgins. Good, Peters. What'd you find out? You were right, sir. After the girl got off the train with the colonel, I went into a compartment. There were unmistakable signs of dark-colored face powder. There were also traces both of blonde hair and black hair. The black hair had definitely come out of a wig. Uh -huh. Apparently, the girl must board the train, get a compartment, and change her appearance before she comes out and meets the colonel. Uh -huh. Then it is Adele Winston. 
Because he's been absent from Washington at the same time as the Colonel has. Probably she explained to the Colonel that because of her prominent standing, she must disguise herself. And this Adele Winston must have been the mysterious woman with whom Harold Blake went off on trips before he was murdered. Without a doubt. She's connected with his murder in some manner. And now, right now, she and the Colonel are down at Virginia Beach. Very much like the Harold Blake setup. That's what I'm afraid of, Peter. And we've got to make sure Colonel Higgins isn't killed the same way. Back to David Harding, counter-spy, in just a moment. But first, Mail Pouch is one of America's best-known and most popular chewing tobaccos. A popularity and preference built on uniform, consistent quality and delightful taste and flavor. On or off the job, Mail Pouch is a favorite because chewing serves to steady nerves. And Mail Pouch helps to ease the tension of hard, strenuous work. Helps to relax tired, tense minds and bodies. Mail Pouch is delicious and satisfying, full of pleasure and long-lasting goodness. Because it is made of choice selected tobaccos, properly aged and skillfully blended to an exclusive formula. Next time you buy chewing tobacco, buy a supply of Mail Pouch. Treat yourself to the best. Now back to David Harding, Counter Spy. What a beautiful sunset, Adele. Yes, it is beautiful, Roy. I love to lie on the beach after all the others have gone on. Yes, it is nice. Roy, sometimes I see a look come over your face. Anything troubling you? No, dear, nothing. That, that you're worrying about your responsibilities. Those charts you have to have made before Japan is invaded. No, I don't think I am. <laughs> I wish we didn't have to go back to Washington tomorrow. Oh, but we must, though. I've got some important conferences. Oh, here, put these in your bag, will you, Adele? I'm afraid I'll lose them in the sand. <laughs> well, why bring keys out of the beach? Well, I don't dare leave them in the hotel room. This little flat key. Well, it's quite an odd shape. What do you think? It's the key to the secret cabinet in my library, where I keep the confidential shop. Oh, no, Roy. Don't give me the keys. It's too big a responsibility. <laughs> All right. I'll hide them next time, under the rug at the hotel. <laughs> Let's go in the water. Come on. All right. I'll beat you to oh, it. Oh, just try. Oh, hello, Colonel Higgins. Glad to see you. Sit down. Thank you. I thought it might be better for us to meet openly at the hotel dining room rather than me to go again to your apartment. A good many things have happened since we last talked, Harding. Yes. You've proved yourself a veteran. A trained counter spy agent. Couldn't have done better. Anything the matter, Harding? Well, I think the big moment's here. It's now or never. All right. Just give me your orders. I'd like to have you invite Miss Winston up to your apartment Wednesday night for an informal dinner. Just you two. Oh, I... You don't think, do you, Harding, Miss Winston is a spy? Yes, Colonel, I do. But Harding, I kept the key to my secret file where she could get it. He even called her attention to it. Harding, tell me the truth. You don't think Miss Winston was the girl who was with Blake on those trips before he committed suicide? Yes. His blood is on her hands, Colonel. And she's probably been responsible for the death of a dozen other men. Now, Wednesday night, after you've had dinner, I wish you'd go with her into your library for coffee. But under no conditions, Colonel, drink the coffee. I'll casually drop in a little later. You intend to break her Wednesday night? If I can. I hope I can. What's the matter, Colonel? White as a sheep. I'm all right. Can I get you something? No. What is it, sir? You can tell me. Harding. 
I'd fallen in love with her. You don't mean that, yes. Yes, I do mean it. I love her. Good heavens, you can't. But I do. I think she's innocent. She didn't even try to duplicate the key. She, well, she's never even tried to ask me questions about secret government affairs. He's a murderer, Colonel. He double crossed you in a second. I didn't realize how lonely I've been. She's so clever, smart, beautiful. Everything about her. I can't stand it. You're not thinking of doing what Harold Blake did? No. No, not that. I guess I can see it through. I'm sorry, Colonel. Terribly sorry. Well, I guess there's no more to be said. We'll go through with it tomorrow night, as planned. Yes. But remember, do not drink any coffee that's poured. I wish I could say something, Colonel Higgins. I feel for you from the bottom of my heart. But this is bigger than you or me. I know. But still, I think she's innocent. Champagne, Adele? Please, Roy. That's a stunning evening gown. Very flattering. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. More champagne for you, sir. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, and James. Yes, sir. Uh, Miss Adele and I will have our brandy and coffee in the library tonight. Yes, sir. And uh, I'd like to have you remain this evening. Very good, sir. Oh, by the way, Adele, uh, did you ever know Harold Blake? Blake? Oh, wasn't he the man who committed suicide about four months ago? Yes. Well, I, I guess I must have seen him. I don't think I remember him. An awful thing, wasn't it? Hmm. Wasn't there some talk that, that it wasn't suicide? Oh, rumors, I suppose. Oh, like silverware? <laughs> you caught me looking at it, Roy. <laughs> yes, I do like it. You know, I had thought I was perfectly contented. Now it all seems so insignificant. To have something really worthwhile, you've got to have someone to share it with. I found the same thing too, Roy. Closeness and comradeship mean more than anything. So I have James serve the coffee and brandy in the library now? Yes, I think. I'd rather sit on the divan with you. <laughs> and, uh, you look like the most sophisticated woman in the world, like one of those gorgeous paintings. And then you'll say something so tender. But a woman should be a mystery to a man. <sighs> there. And, uh, I know. If you don't know how much... Oh, yes, I do, Roy. My heart's been acting the same way. It's been ever since that last trip. Do you love me, Adele? Yes, Roy. Very dearly. <coughs> oh, I... Pardon me, sir, but a Mr. Harding and his friend have called. Oh, oh yes. Yes, James. Uh, show them in, will you? Oh, yes, sir. Why did they have to come at just this moment? Well, Harding's a very good friend. I guess he's just dropping in. We were on our way to the club. Thought we'd stop in, Colonel. Oh, I'm oh, glad to see you, Harding. Uh, have you met uh, Miss Winston? No, I don't believe I've had that privilege. Good evening, Miss Winston. Good evening, Mr. Harding. Miss Winston, there's a friend of mine, Mr. Peters. Good evening, Mr. Peters. Pleasure. Colonel Higgins Peters. Good evening, Mr. Peters. Uh, won't you join us in brandy and coffee? No, thank you. Well, sit down, gentlemen. Make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. Well, while you men chat, I think I'll go and freshen up a bit. Well, we'll miss you. <laughs> you men stay here and talk. I'll be back in just a few moments. Harding, it can't be true. That woman is innocent. Colonel Higgins, ordinarily I wouldn't operate this way. But I owe it to you. Uh, tell me, Harding, tell me. She's really one of your agents working with you. Tell me that you suspected me and really did, it, did this so she could check on me. Tell me that. Ease my mind. Colonel, would you ring for the butler, please? Oh, yes. Yes. Harding, it's the butler you're really after. Tell me it's he and not Adele, isn't it? Colonel, 
I know how upset you are. I sympathize. But I can't change the facts. Now, don't say anything for a minute. Did you ring for me, sir? I believe the colonel wanted you to pour some brandy for me, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. This is a gun on your stomach. Don't move. Harding. Sorry, Colonel. Put the cuffs on him, Peters. No. I've got him, sir. And he's the man you're after, not Adele. And I believe he... No. There. Without his wig, he looks more natural, like his pictures. Your butler, Colonel Higgins, is Victor Strauss, one of the cleverest international spies. I'm not. I don't know what you're talking about. Colonel, you might be interested to know that when your former butler was hurt by a car six weeks ago, it was a plot. The man at the wheel of the car which ran down your butler was this man standing here. He wanted to pose as a butler so he could get into your house here. We've been checking him for weeks. Here, you. Drink this coffee you serve the colonel. Uh Oh, you don't like doped coffee, yes, Scott? Please, Harding. Adele's coming back. What will I do? Watch her when she comes in. I think she'll be pretty surprised. What is the matter in here? What? Is that your butler? His hair? Yes, Miss Winston. We removed his wig. <laughs> Why? Well, for the reason he happens not to be a butler. But Victor Strauss, a very noted international spy. A spy? He's a spy. Yes, and quite a catch. Well, I'm so glad you caught him. Peters, take Strauss over to the other side of the room. That's it. Come on, you know. Come on. Roy, you must feel terribly about this taking place in your apartment. Here, take this brandy. You look like a ghost. Thank you, Adele. Thanks. Colonel Higgins, I have a recording I'd like to play for you. Would you mind my using your machine? Why, no, no. The switch is right on the side of the radio. Thank you. It's just a short recording. I feel a little dizzy. I guess I'll sit here by you, Adele. What kind of a record is it, Mr. Harding? What's the purpose of it? Well, I believe it'll be self-explanatory. It was made last night. There. The voices were speaking rather softly at the time, but I'll turn on the full volume so we won't miss anything. told me he kept them in the wall safe in his library. If we don't find them, you'll just have to keep on playing at that old fool. I want to spit in his face every time I get near him. Well, the plans aren't here. We failed tonight. But he'll probably put them in here tomorrow night. Oh, I hope tonight would be the last. We must break him and force him to commit suicide the way Blake did. If he won't, we'll poison his coffee. Oh. Not so quick. You thug, you vermin, I'll kill you. Adele, Adele, what are you saying? You think you're fine. Fortunately, Colonel Higgins, the plans weren't there. If they had been, you wouldn't be alive tonight. Adele, if they'd gotten them, Adele Winston would have taunted you. She'd have gotten you intoxicated. She'd have told you she'd gotten the plans. You'd be disgraced. She'd have broken your heart. Or you'd have done what all the other men have done she's worked on. I would have laughed at the stupid dog. Colonel, her real name is Gerta Stenya of Hungary and perhaps of Japan, a paid spy who goes to the highest bidder. And that man, Victor Strauss, is her husband. No. Take them all the way, Peters. The other agents are out in the front hall. Let go of me! You can't do this! Do you let go of me! You... I'm awfully sorry, Colonel. I had to expose the whole plot in front of you so you'd never have any doubt. I didn't know a person could be hurt quite as much. You may have saved the lives, Colonel, of thousands of our men. I hope so. There have been a lot of people who have given all they had in this war. Hello, Colonel. Through the window. Returned veterans coming down the street. You've done them and men like them a great service, Colonel Higgins. No one will probably ever know about it, but you will. I will. I know. And Harding, I'm glad I was able to help. After all, the war isn't over yet. Every one of us has still got to sacrifice. Some one way, some another. I guess this way is mine. In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's counter-spy case with David Harding. But in the meantime, 
Mr. Pipe Smoker, once you get that white burly Kentucky Club flavor in your pipe, you'll have the sweetest pipe you ever smoked. There's no other tobacco quite like white burly Kentucky Club when it comes to keeping a pipe in good taste. For Kentucky Club is a mild, free-burning smoking tobacco, pleasant and inviting from the first puff right down to the bottom of the bowl. It is mild the way you want it, yet is fully satisfying. It stays lit and burns clean, leaves your pipe sweet and fragrant. The white burly tobacco, blended the special Kentucky Club way, truly makes a difference. That's why pipe smokers everywhere agree that quality and smoking pleasure considered, it is truly America's number one smoking value, a value that challenges comparison. Smoke Kentucky Club Pipe Tobacco. Treat yourself to real pipe smoking enjoyment. David Harding speaking. Of the hundreds of counter-spy cases handled by my office, I feel the case we're going to dramatize on next week's program is the most unusual. It concerns probably the smallest thing ever sabotaged, so tiny it is invisible, so important that potentially it may affect every single one of us and be considered one of the great discoveries of all time. I invite you to listen. Wednesday, June 20th, same time, same station. David Harding, Counter Spy. David Harding, Counter Spy, is a Phillips H. Lord production for the Mail Pouch Tobacco Company of Wheeling, West Virginia. Don Lowe speaking. This is the Blue Network of the American Broadcasting Company. Fresh, the new cream deodorant presents David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington, calling David Harding, counter-spy. Washington, calling David Harding, counter-spy. Harding, counter-spy, calling Washington. David Harding, counter-spy, is brought to you by Fresh. Fresh. The new cream deodorant that stops perspiration worries safely. Switch to fresh, to be sure. Two weeks ago, Charles Pierce, a man in his early thirties, immaculately dressed, slight, with piercing eyes, stood in the hallway of a large graystone apartment building in Baltimore. With him was a young woman, Dora Lester. I do not feel this is good, Charles. The biggest opportunity we ever had, Dora. You have never met this man. Oh, I know all about him, though. He is in command. You're very strange in my stomach. A woman's intuition. That's enough. We're paid well to take chances. You do not think this is a trick? You have your gun? <laughs> Always. But I won't need it, Dora. It's a great honor to meet him. His espionage work is known all over the world. For two years, he was in command of all Gestapo agents in Spain. Yes? Mr. Burley? Yes? We received your message to come here. When? Day before yesterday. We were in Boston. Come in. Come over to the table. 
Just sit down, please. Now, if you will establish your identity. Now, this is my lady friend, Dora Lester. She worked with me under hard Just a moment. Remove your hat, Dora. Why, yes, yes. Uh-huh. This picture is a very good likeness of you. you. You've got a picture of me? When was it taken? The important part is that it was taken for identification. So you use the name Charles Pierce. Well, you wish some identification, Mr. Burley? Unnecessary. I was standing unobserved right at the desk of the hotel when you signed in last night. I wanted to see your handwriting. Well, no wonder, Mr. Burley, you're famous for your precautions. From now on, you two will take orders from me. Come along. May I ask where we are going? To the eighth floor balcony of a certain building. You'll be very surprised at what you see. A person could very easily fall to his death from this balcony. Couldn't he, Mr. Burley? Very easily, Dora. Now, Charles, see that long, low building over there? The one fenced in with the barbed wire? Yes. That building is the United States Government Laboratory. It covers these two acres. And the guards who are patrolling there? Just a moment. Till I close the fire door. Uh. There are 12 guards there. Night and day. There's a beam of an electric eye which goes all around the building. Automatic protective devices of every description. So they protect in gold? Something even more valuable. Bugs. Bugs? You're fooling. No. They have bugs in there worth as much as $5,000 each. I hate bugs. I couldn't hate any bug worth $5,000. What is the mystery of them, Mr. Burley? One of the greatest allies of the Japanese, disease caused by jungle bugs. Disease Americans have never experienced. Well, the United States government has had hundreds of specialists capturing these odd bugs in the Pacific. Oh. These bugs are brought to this country and placed in that building. Each species, especially heated rooms, tropical conditions, their own special food. They're bred there. Millions of them. You mean they keep all of the bugs there so the United States can experiment on them to develop poison sprays to kill each different kind? Exactly. New poisonous sprays could not be developed to kill these bugs if there were not thousands of those different species to experiment on. The breeding of some of these bugs is a very complicated process. For instance, Mr. Burley, United States Marines land on an island. Yes, and possibly in 24 hours, a certain percentage of the Marine invaders will be suffering from sickness caused by some kind of a bite from these little-known bugs. Each island, each jungle is hundreds of different kinds. But suppose the Marines do know about the bugs before they land. What can they do about it? If a certain poisonous spray has been developed, effective against the type of bugs they know they will encounter... American planes fly over the island. Thousands of gallons of the spray. Spray the jungles. Many of the bugs were destroyed. Mm -hmm. No wonder those bugs in that laboratory are valuable. But the way that laboratory is guarded, it would be impossible to get near it or destroy the bugs. Impossible for anyone but me. See that building just at the end of the laboratory? Yeah. That is a scientific library. And it is open to medical students who wish to do research there on insecticides. Is it guarded? Certainly. The guard at the door. He searches everyone when they enter or leave. The guard's name is Connors. Connors. In the evening when he's off duty, Connors often drinks beer down the street over at that restaurant with a sign. Yeah. You are to meet him. Find out what his hobbies are. What he eats. What he likes. Then report to me by telephone. Hello? Mr. Burley? Yes? That gentleman. 
woman you asked me to meet. Yeah? I've become quite friendly with him. His hobby is, uh, dogs. Dogs? Yes. He talks about them by the hour. Oh. Very interesting. Uh, what shall I do? Come to my apartment at 11 to 9. And you visit the scientific library again tomorrow? I will have had something planned. Hello, Connors. Hi, Charlie. Well, I'll be... Of all the times you've come to the library here, you didn't tell me you owned a dog. <laughs> How do you like him? Come here, boy. Come here. <laughs> hey, that's a peach of a dog. Belgian Shepherd. Yeah. Boy, let's see your mouth. <laughs> you liking dogs so much, Carter, you sold me the idea. So I bought this one. About two years old, huh? Uh-huh. Now you got something. Yeah, and he's highly trained. I don't want to lose out on my reading at the library here, so uh, can't I take him in with me and tie him to the leg of a chair? Well, I don't know as I should let you, but... <laughs> yeah, that dog's almost human, ain't he? How about it? Okay, take him in with you. Hey, Charlie! Wait a minute. Yeah? I gotta set you, you know. You still have to, after knowing me so well? This library section's right next to the scientific laboratory, you know. I wouldn't let my own mother in without searching her. Okay. Arms up. Turn around. Okay. You're sure a thorough guard, Gun is. I got two kids in the Pacific. You bet I'm thorough. Okay, Charlie. If you keep them quiet, you can take them in. Dora, this dog doesn't like Mr. Burley's apartment here. I can see from the way he looks, Charlie. Now, Charles. Yes, sir? For three weeks now, you've been taking this dog into the library next to the laboratory. You sure the guard likes the dog? Connie? Crazy about him. That ammo potassium I gave for the dog. Really made him look good and sick. Oh, yeah, yeah. His nose was hot and dry. His, uh, his eyes glassy. Uh -huh. And you did not bring the dog's apparent sickness to the attention of Connor. Oh, no, no, no. I was just going into the scientific library with a dog when he looked at him and he said, uh, Your dog's sick, Charlie. Give him sulfur thiazole. Well. And if I was you, I'd put a blanket on him for a couple of days. Keep him bundled up. Perfect. So the guard himself suggested the blank. Sure did. Wonderful. <laughs> hey, easy, boy, easy. Come here. It's our big moment, Charlie. A climax. Now, the pentalite. Pentalite? What's that? It's an explosive more powerful than TNT. Explosive? That's right. And a little time watch. That'll set it off. You, you will sew the explosive and the time watch right into the underside of the dog's blanket. Well, I... you will walk into the library with a sick dog that the guard Connors has got a weakness for. He'll search you, and with his type of mind, he'll never think to feel under the dog's heavy blanket because he himself suggested the blanket. Yeah, yeah. But what about me? You'll tie the dog to a leg of a chair in the library. The time watch will set the charge off at exactly 11. At five minutes of 11, make an excuse. Walk out. Disappear. Well, I... I dreamed of such a thing. I'll blow the library and the laboratory with all its expensive bugs off the face of the earth. It'll take them years to collect and breed new ones. It seems like the dog knows what's going on. Tomorrow morning, Charles. Take the dog in the taxi cab. Drive right to the laboratory. 
to have enough explosive wrapped around him to blow a city to kingdom come. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we come to that part of our program known as Be Fresh or Be Fired. <laughs> yes, the Be Fresh or Be Fired department. Maybe you might want to call it the Be Fresh or Be Lonely department. Well, anyhow, it's a quiz corner where a fresh answer is always welcome. First question. Why do you refer to 4 o'clock in the working day as a time when you're apt to come up against the deodorant deadline? And the answer? Because when you're working, an embarrassing deodorant failure is more likely to happen toward the day's end. When you're out on a date at night, 10 o'clock is another sort of zero hour. But why be worried? Switch to that new cream deodorant fresh to be sure. Second, a man's question. Is using fresh a sissy thing to do? And the answer? Well, fresh is a big seller among GIs and post exchanges all around the world. That's plenty answer. Which brings us to a question frequently asked. I get conflicting advice from people I know on how to be sure of personal daintiness. I'm confused. Well, friends, as many famous beauty editors and authorities on good grooming can tell you, modern science has the answer. And fresh brings it to you. In fresh, you get the benefit of the most effective perspiration-stopping ingredient known to science. Fresh contains an exclusive ingredient. Fresh cream deodorant stops perspiration worries completely and safely. It's safe for you and for your clothing. It's creamy and smooth, not sticky, doesn't dry out, and it's never gritty. So it's a pleasure to switch to fresh, to be sure. Back to David Harding, Counter Spy. Hey, driver, pull up right in front of the scientific library. Right next to the, uh, the laboratories, eh? Okay, buddy. What's the matter with your dog? Got the pip? <laughs> Not feeling good. I was wondering why you had a blanket on him in this hot weather. Fifty-five, mister. Let me get my dog out first. Come on, boy. Get out. Get out. <laughs> he seems to like staying in my cab, huh? Get out. Come on, come on, come on. Hey, I guess he sees the big dog the woman's got over there. Got chained for dollar? Oh, sure. Well, I guess the big police dog over there don't like your dog. Stop it, stop it. Hey, there. Hey, that woman's having trouble holding her dog. Hey, hold on to your dog. Don't bring him over here. I can't hold him. He's stronger than I am. There's going to be some action. Hey, hold on to that dog. Boy, come here, come here. You're too late, mister. Well, you got to hold that dog. Get your dog away. I can't Come on, boy. Come here, come here. She's lost it. Experimental Laboratories, there has been a big explosion on sidewalk, blowing taxi cab and two or more persons to pieces. Emergency. Harding speaking. All roving Washington counter spy investigators leave for Baltimore immediately. Emergency. Explosion in front of government laboratories. Everett, I want you to leave for Baltimore with me at once. This is the craziest case I ever heard of, Mr. Harding. Why would anybody want to blow up the street in front of the government experimental laboratory? You think it was an attempt to blow up the laboratory and it went wrong? Definitely. The guard in the research laboratory saw it happen. And the explosion resulted from a dogfight. A dogfight? The most fantastic thing. We're up against a very unusual mind, Everett. 
Anything left from the explosion to examine? Nothing. The man who had one of the dogs, the woman who had the other dog, the taxi cab, the taxi cab driver, all were blown to bits. It was a terrific explosion. As soon as we reach Baltimore, we'll set up a thorough investigation. Baltimore Field Office, Harding speaking. We located the kennels, Mr. Harding, where the dog was bought. A man came in, he bought the dog without leaving his name or address. What do our agents report from the scene of the explosion? Another thing. It must have been a terrific explosion. What about the man who drove the taxi? Uh, he's a discharged veteran, a good American. Oh. Uh, well, Everett, this is one of the most uniquely conceived plots. There just isn't any starting point. Let me think a minute. We've got to find the starting point. These agents will make another attempt to destroy that laboratory. What are your orders, sir? Enemy agents had a dog. They now don't have a dog. We could start a house-to-house canvas. Well, that'll take us months. Come back to the field office, Everett. I've got an idea. We'll work out of here. I'm feeling very nervous, Mr. Burley. Can't we leave this apartment and go someplace? What time is it, Dora? Almost midnight. All right. We'll go out to eat. Seems funny not having Charlie around. Don't mention that fool who bungled my whole plan. Have the newspapers said anything about the explosion? Just one little item. The government must have clamped down on censorship. You're uh, going to try some other way to destroy the laboratory? Of course. But this time I'll do it myself. Oh. You're, um, you're rather pretty, Dora. <laughs> I like you, too. But who's, who's that? You don't suppose Charlie really wasn't killed? Oh, strange, this time of night. I'm frightened. Stop it. I didn't leave one possible clue. Yes? Are you Mr. Burley who lives here? Yes. I'm David Harding of the United States Counter Spies. Is one of my agents, Mr. Everett. May we come in, Mr. Burley? Why, yes, yes, come in. This is Miss Dora Lester, a friend of mine. How do you do, Miss Lester? This is Mr. Everett. How do you do? Miss Lester? May I ask why you have called, Mr. Harding? Well, three days ago, Mr. Burley, there was a dog which caused an explosion in front of the Baltimore Scientific Laboratory. Why, that's strange. Yes. Very strange, Mr. Burley. In fact, peculiar. These are government orders. Neither one of you is to move. Just a minute. A whole minute at all. I'm frisking you. No gun. Ever check, Miss Lester? No gun either. Mr. Harding, your attitude is uncalled for. Mr. Burley, my men have been covering Baltimore. Restaurants, meat markets, pet shops, formulas, everything. Well, we found a restaurant right across the street where a man had been buying food for a dog every day. He hasn't bought any such food for the last three days. I suppose you're referring to me. Yes. Well, uh, what am I supposed to say? You're supposed to do some pretty tall explaining. Where is your dog, Mr. Burley? He, uh, died. Oh? He didn't die by being blown to bits, did he, Mr. Burley? No. My dog died a natural death. Ah, I see. Well, when a dog does die a natural death, of course, there's always the body. Isn't it? Why, uh, yes. Where is your dog's body, Mr. Burley? Well, I was very attached to him. I took him and buried him in the country. Suppose you show us where. At this time of night? Yes. All right. Must I drive out, too? I'm afraid, Miss Lester, you must. David Harding will be back in a moment. But meanwhile, what do you think is the best advice to give to a young lady who says... You know, when my lipstick has gone back on me... 
Well, when it's worn off or, <laughs> or maybe kissed off, my little mirror is a good friend. It always warns me. But when my deodorant has gone back on me, nothing or no one will warn me. What's a girl to do? Well, friends, as many famous beauty editors and experts on good grooming and personal charm can tell you, modern science has the answer. And Fresh brings it to you. Yes, Fresh contains the most effective perspiration-stopping ingredient known. Fresh contains an exclusive ingredient. Fresh stops perspiration worries completely and safely. Ladies and gentlemen, each and every one of you, someday, sometime, may reach your deodorant deadline. The deodorant you are using may suddenly stop working. Why take chances? For lasting protection, switch to Fresh. To be sure, that's... F-R-E-S-H. Fresh. Now, back to David Harding, Counter Spy. Like me to help you raise a little digging, Mr. Hunting? They're doing all right, thank you, Mr. Burley. I'll just switch the beam of the searchlight, Everett. I feel like I'm going to faint. Keep still, Dora. You evidently don't believe me about burying my dog here, Mr. Hunting. I'm afraid I don't, Mr. Burley. Look, Mr. Harding. There is something down there. What? Huh. Everett, dig a little more right there. Right. Can you beat that? What do you think, Chief? Let me focus the flashlight. Mr. Burley? I apologize. Well, let's forget it. I thought your whole story of burying your dog here was preposterous. Well, I've had a dog for quite a while. Three days ago, he got taken with cramps. Died before I could get a doctor. I felt so badly, I brought him here and buried him in this field. Miss Lester, we owe you an apology also. I'm so nervous and upset, frightened me so the way you came into the apartment. We do make mistakes sometimes, and this is one. Well, we'll just have to start from the beginning again and look for another clue. I'll arrange immediately, Mr. Burley, for one of my agents to drive you and Miss Lester back to your apartment. Seems so good to be back in the apartment again. The fool driver running out of gas. <laughs> All over being upset from your experience tonight, Dora? Yes, Mr. Burley, I guess so. Everyone makes mistakes, you know. Even Mr. Harding. He'd be a very charming man. I don't see how you ever found in that darkness where you buried that dog. Oh, that was simple. That was a dirty trick you pulled on me, Burley. I'm not in the habit of telling everyone everything. You could have told me that you killed another dog and buried him out there. How do you think I felt all that time when you were claiming you did? And I thinking as soon as we got out there, there wouldn't be any dog's grave and we'd be caught. You might as well learn to trust my judgment. I'll go into your room and get cleaned up. We'll go out to a restaurant and get something to eat. Charles used to tell me everything he was doing. And Charles spoiled my whole plan and got himself blown to pieces. Just the same, we had fun together and we... <laughs> Get your hands up. Both of you. What's the meaning of this? Put your hands out. These cuffs are going on you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can explain. You've already done your explaining, Burley. I hoped you wouldn't suspect anything when my agent pretended to run out of gas while bringing you two back to the apartment. It gave me time to go to the police station and see if anyone during the past three days had lost a black shepherd dog with a tooth missing from the lower right jaw. What does that prove? It proves that when your other dog was blown to pieces, you didn't dare go to the kennels and buy another. So you looked until you could steal one. 
You killed him and buried him out there just in case there was some slip and you were approached. Will I be put in prison if I tell everything I know? Shut up, you fool. What I'd like to do to you, Burley, is throw you to a whole kennel of dogs. They give you what you deserve. But instead, you're going to go to the electric chair. And a lot of men will be coming home from the Pacific who wouldn't be if your fiendish plan had worked. Burley, consider yourself under arrest by the United States government for espionage and murder. And now here is Mr. Harding to tell you about next week's case. I have before me a report of a German minesweeper which has just sailed into an Atlantic port and given itself up. I have here a report of a suspect living at an expensive, exclusive summer hotel overlooking that same port. This girl has recently fallen in love. And here's a report of a body just found in the same harbor. All these things don't happen like that unless they're carefully planned. This case is an emergency. We're leaving to investigate it immediately. Hear the startling, exciting account of this case, Wednesday, August 1st, same time, same station. David Harding, Counter Spy. <laughs> David Harding, Counter Spy, is brought to you by Fresh. Fresh, the new cream deodorant that stops perspiration worries safely. Switch to Fresh, to be sure. David Harding Counter Spy is a Phillips H. Lloyd production for Fresh, the new cream deodorant. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Old Nick. Old, old Nick? Oh, boy, Old Nick is a wonderful candy bar. And fit a honey. Fit a honey? It's a honey, honey, honey of a candy bar. Present David Harding Counter Spy. <laughs> Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. Before we begin today's counter spy case, Sally, let's try another experiment in psychology with a bit of honey candy bar. Like the one they reported in Life magazine a while back when yeah. we did mental telepathy for old Nick? Yes, except today, just for fun, let's try conditioned reaction. Jesse Crawford will help us. And uh, now, the, in the bit of honey song, these four notes stand for the words bit of honey. <laughs> Those notes are a musical symbol for the words bit of honey. In a few seconds, our listeners will find that little tune brings the same sense of delicious satisfaction that is now produced by the words bit of honey. Okay, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always fine, but especially in the summertime. You see, has a distinctive mild honey flavor sprinkled all through. Our crunchy crushed almonds, the separate wrapping of the six generous pieces in a candy bar makes it extra easy and convenient to eat in summertime. What's more, the unusual zesty flavor of candy bar is especially appropriate to warm weather. Why? For yourself, wherever fine candy is sold, ask for candy bar this evening if you can. You'll agree that, yes, bit of honey is a honey, honey, honey of a candy bar, and only five cents. On last April 11, Mary Linton, a dark-complexioned woman of 30 with intense, piercing eyes, stood in the center of the large Brooklyn garage, which she owned, watching several men work on some late-model automobiles. Cora Linton, her younger sister and a very pretty girl, watched the repair work for a moment and then turned to Mary. Mary? Mary? Hmm? 
Uh, sorry, Cora. You saying something? Yeah, I think I'm going to trot off to the movie. Stick around for a while, Cora. Oh, but Mary, I don't do it. Stick around. I'm expecting Jack Taylor soon. Mary, you know how I feel about Jack. And I know how Jack feels about you. Stay put. Say hello to him. I hate him. He's a good... He's all right. If you'll stick with me, he's going to have a good future. Besides, he's crazy about you. He's Mary, I do. That must be Jack now. All right. Open her up, Tony. Hello, Jack. Cora. Ah, you waiting for me, beautiful? No, I was just... She stayed to say hello to you, Jack. Well, Mary, what do you think of this car? It's a real beaut, ain't she? Buick 1942 Deluxe. Uh Uh-huh. Good enough. Cora, didn't I tell you Jack is a smart boy? Yeah. You can't be a dodo and pick up cars like this, Cora. You know, Mary, the sucker didn't even leave his keys in ignition. I had to switch wires to start it. And it only took me 50 seconds flat. For that 50 seconds work, you're going to get 250 bucks. 250 bucks? Hey, this car's worth 1800 If you had a bill of sale for it, Jack. But now i got to have the serial numbers changed, switch parts, get the car out of the country. Two fifty's a good price for a hot car. That's not that much. I'll have taken it in one condition. What's that? Cora helps me spend it. No, I... Sure she will, Jack. Come on inside the office. I'll give you the money. Scotch or rye, Cora? I don't want anything to drink, Mary. Just yourself. I wish you'd listen when I want to say something. I know what you're going to say. You don't like the racket we're in. Yes. Being nice to those crooks... How can you do this to me, Mary? Look, my darling sister. In my own funny way, I love you. Sure. I want you to be nice to Jack Taylor because the sap brings me $1,800 cars for $250. But if Jack or anybody gets fresh with you, I'll put a bullet in him myself. But it's not only Jack. I'm scared of the cops and the counter spies. If we're caught, I... I'll see that you slip out. Meanwhile, the racket is paying for this swell apartment, all our clothes, anything we want. Honest, Mary, I'd rather go to work. Doing what? You can't even type. Forget it. Let me do the work. I'll take that. Yep. Miss Linton? Which one? Mary Linton. Speaking. I'm Miss Linton. My name is Sam French. I'm from Chicago. So? A mutual friend of ours told me to look you up. Who is he? Alf Burton. Yeah? Alf Burton's a very good friend of mine. Alf and I are bodies. Can I come over to see you? Why not? We'll be home. You've got the address, I suppose? Right. Bye. Bye. Who is that, Mary? A man named Sam French from Chicago. He says Al Burton sent him. Who? Al Burton, Chicago. You don't know him. Anybody he sends over should be all right, I guess. Not sure, hmm? Nothing like making sure, Cora. We're going to check before we get chummy. Mary Linton? Oh, no, I'm Cora Linton, her sister. Oh. Uh, Mary's inside. Won't you come in? Thank you. Look, your sister's as beautiful as you. Don't move, Mr. French. I don't understand. What's your gun for? I'll tell you in a minute. Cora, see if Mr. French has a gun. All right. Yes, he has one. Take it. I have it. Now step away from Mr. French. Now, Mr. French, you may walk into the living room. 
I still don't understand. I'm a friend of Alf Burton's. That's what you say, Mr. French. I want to hear it myself from Alf Burton. I'm fine, Alf. Look, reason I'm phoning you, did you send up a friend to see me? Sure did, Mary. Smart boy named Sam French. Well, there's a guy here now who claims he's Sam French. What does he look like? About five feet nine or ten, blue eyes, straight, short nose. So far, so good? A uh, nice looking boy with them blue eyes and blonde hair. Hold it. What'd you say about his hair? Wait, I forgot I to tell you. It's Don't blonde. move. I'll that again and I'll blast you. Alf. What'd you say was the color of Sam French's hair? Blonde. Color is straw. Can't miss it. Man, here is dark-haired, black. Hold it. Now, wait a minute. Just give me a chance to talk, will you? Talk fast, Mr. My hair's dyed. I had to pull the police. I didn't want them to know I was going to New York. Examine my hair. You'll see it's dyed. Oh, Mary, maybe he's telling the truth. He's got blue Don't eyes. Don't move. Hello, Al. I'm not sure of this man. Anything more definite I can identify? Uh, yeah. Come to think of it, there is. Sam French has a little strawberry mark in his left arm. Try to get it off once. There's an acid mark around. Wait a minute, I'll see. You, roll up your left sleeve. That's right, my birthmark. I'm going to hold it off. Oh, don't get in front of him. Just see what he's got on his left arm. Oh. There's a small red mark, a birthmark, with a scar around it. Well, your hair could be dying. Uh, thanks, Al. Drop in when you're in New York. Guess you're all right, Sam. Sure. I wouldn't want to go through that again. Sorry. I had to be sure. You're a smart day, Mary. Like Alf said. Just the kind of dame I want to hook up with. We can talk about that at dinner. I know a nice place where we can talk. We owe you a treat for that scare. Nothing, Mary. Not a thing, Mary. Now, can I get down to business? Sure. What's on your mind? I'm looking for a New York contact, Mary. Like you. I can pick up cars in Chicago and points west and ship them to New York. What makes you think I'm interested? Well, Burton tells me you've got some swell outlets. Mexico, South America... I managed to get rid of my car. You could make plenty getting rid of my car. Sure. But there's something else. What? The Cicero mob. So? Who's running the Cicero mob now? Nobody knows. Oh, whoever he is, he's a smart operator. The Cicero mob is my main competition. We run into each other. That's what's worrying you? They're tough. What do you think's going to happen to you, Sam, if you steal cars in their territory and ship them to me? I'll take my chances. I got a few boys of my own who have plenty tough. We'll handle the Cicero mob if we have to. All right. That'll be your funeral. And you'll take my shipments? As many as you can deliver. Good. I'll get my first shipment when I get back to Chicago. When will that be? That depends on Cora. Me? I don't understand. I'd uh, like to spend a few days in New York. That is, if you will show me around, Cora. Oh, really, Sam? Sure, I... Cora will step out with you, Sam. You'll be glad to, won't you, Cora? <laughs> This well, of course. Well, this car drives itself. Where'd you get it, Mr. French? <laughs> I bought it. I wouldn't drive a stolen car. Certainly a bit of honey of a car. Turn into that dirt road ahead. 
Why? It's a shortcut. Now stop. I will not. No? Then I will. I'll take the key. Sam, please. Better relax, Cora. I won't hurt you. Sam. Please give me that key. Uh Uh-uh. When I call Mary, she's not going to like you, Sam. But you're not going to tell her. Sam, she'll kill you, I swear. I can take care of myself. What's more, I'm going to take care of you. Sam, you wouldn't. That's not what you think. I'm just going to, i sort of hold you in protective custody. Protective? What for? I just want your sister to come to terms. But, but I, I, I thought she, you hadn't this evening at the restaurant. That's what I wanted Mary to think, Cora. She doesn't know that I'm the leader of the Cicero mob. Why, you... I don't want to have to hurt you, Cora. This is a private fight between Mary and me. I'm taking over the New York territory, and I'm going to... Be... Oh, Sam! Oh, 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 yeah. oh you all right? Yes. Yeah. Well, the kids are... All right, now. Don't worry. Jack, how'd you know? I just didn't like his face. I didn't like you traveling around with him, so I followed you. So Mary spoke. You made me go out with me. Mary spoke. What's that about Mary? Mary spoke. Mary made me be nice to Sam. Made me nice to all the men I didn't want to. She did, huh? Cora, here, you take my gun. Go on, take it. Put it in your pocketbook so if any other guy tries to pull it back. Thank you. That would it take me home. Sure. Oh, wait a minute. Uh-huh. I got a better idea. Get the gun in your bag. Go on. Drop it on the floor of the car near this punk. Oh, all right. All right, come on. We'll get out of here before somebody sees us. Then we're going to have a talk with Mary. <laughs> What happened? How did you know something happened? My radio. You keep it tuned to the police call. <laughs> Carl, what happened? The police announcer says Sam French is dead. He is. I shot him. Start talking, Jack. Your little playmate from Chicago was going to play kidnap with Cora until you came to terms. Terms? You came to an agreement earlier this evening. Oh, yeah? Sam was leader of the Cicero mob. He came here to get you out of the way. Jack, I, I certainly owe you something for saving Cora. Forget it. Cops think a dame drove Sam's car. Cora must have left a couple of hairpins or something. That's all? Yeah, well, nothing to worry about. The car was Sam's. I'll never trace it to... What's so funny? <laughs> Mary, the murder gun is in the car. Right alongside of Sam French. I don't get it. The cops will, Mary. Cora's fingerprints are all over that gun. What? You crazy? You shot Sam. Sure, sure. But I wiped off my prints and handed the gun to Cora. Her fingerprints are all over it. Cora ran out. The police will think only one thing. Cora killed Sam and ran away. (laughs) Who did that to Cora? You did that to my kid sister, you slimy rat! Dirty double Stop, wait a minute! Stay away from that drawer! Mary's got a gun! That's better. Come on over and sit down, Mary. Why'd you do it? Why'd you pin the kill on Cora? Because you played me for a sucker, Mary. That's why, with Cora for bait. You got me wrong. No, oh, no, you got me wrong. You didn't figure me for a guy who uses his head, did you? Well, baby, it's little Jack Taylor who does all the talking from now on in. All right, Jack. What have you got in mind? Cora here has no police record. The cops will never know whose fingerprints are on that murder gun unless I tell them. And I will tell them, too, unless... Unless what? Unless you and me become partners, baby. Well, that's the way it is. Yeah. 50-50 on the whole setup. 
Nothing small about you, is there, Jack? Not a thing. The Sam French dead will take over his Cicero mob. Well, what do you say? You know I wouldn't turn Cora over to the police. Okay, then we're partners. Now, how did you come to hook up with Sam French? Friend of mine. Alf Burton in Chicago. Alf Burton, huh? Okay, that's my first stop. Alf Burton in Chicago. Counter Spy will continue in just a moment. But right now, I can see that Jimmy wants to wheedle an old Nick candy bar or a nickel out of me. Today, Jimmy, you won't do it. I'm determined. You're absolutely right, Mr. Krupp. Uh, I want to apologize for the way I've been putting you on the spot. I've flattered you, asked your riddles, and teased you in order to get old Nick candy bars. It's not fair, is it? Oh, Jimmy, I don't really mind. No, sir, I haven't been fair. For instance, you have an old Nick candy bar in your pocket today, haven't you? Well, certainly, I always have an old Nick candy bar handy. It's as fine a candy bar as I know with that thick milk chocolate coating. Creamy, buttery, smooth caramel. And the fudge and... Oh, fresh toasted nuts. It sure is good eating. Well, today, if I pointed how much money you make, a big-time radio announcer... Scale, that is. And how you got plenty of old Nick candy bars, and uh, how utterly delicious old Nick candy bars are, and how I'm broke and don't have any, and I'm so hungry for an old Nick... Well... If I did that, it'd make you sound like the worst kind of a heel if you didn't give me one. Wouldn't it? Mm, okay, Jimmy, here you are. Now tell him what you think of old Nick, you rascal. Old Nick? <laughs> oh, boy! Old Nick is a wonderful candy bar. <laughs> Get some soon, folks. Wherever fine candy is sold. You'll like old Nick. <laughs> Now, back to our counter-spy case. I'll take this report into Mr. Harding myself. Busy, Chief? Oh, hello, Peter. They're studying this map layout of stolen cars in the United States. Maybe this teletype report will fit in, Chief. Sam French, a hot car artist from Chicago, was just killed in New York. Uh-oh. This may be the beginning. Of what? This report of stolen cars shows that the heaviest concentrations around New York and Chicago. Sam French, a Chicago mobster, being killed in New York means only one thing. The New York and Chicago gangs are beginning to cross each other. Exactly. Peters, there's enough incentive in stolen cars for gangsters to start a bloody massacre that may rival Prohibition days. We've got to stop it, Peters, before it gets started. Tell him up, Mr. Bill? Call me Al. A friend of Mary Linton is a friend of mine, Jack. Ah, glad to hear it. Besides, it's a piece of quick change for helping Mary. In what way? Information. What do you want to know? Sam French died. Okay. Who's running the Cicero mob now? It ain't settled yet. Several of the boys have ideas. Well, they better forget those ideas. The Cicero mob is going to be run from New York. These boys are tough and hungry. They ain't giving up nothing. Well, listen to reason, huh? Each one of them boys figures he'll be the big boss. I can't waste any time. Don't see how you can rush matters. Like I said, they have their own ideas. They have their own ideas, huh? Alf. What are the names of the boys with the ideas? Gang war is flaring up in Chicago, Mr. Harding. What's the report? Two more gangsters killed in Chicago. Both men were connected with Sam French at one time. Sam French again. Peters, have they turned up on anything on the Sam French killing? Nothing new, Chief. There's a clear set of fingerprints on the gun, but the local police haven't yet identified the prints. 
Peters wire our New York field office. And? Have them step into the Sam French case. Requisition the murder weapon and have it sent to Washington. Also have our New York office put the murder car through the laboratory. Will do, Chief. Well, I guess I kind of got this little blowout coming to me, huh, Mary? You're working fast, Jack. But those men who were killed in Chicago... Ah, uh, listen to the baby. There'll be plenty more killed before I'm finished, Carl. I'm organizing Chicago. If I have to knock off every last mobster in that town... Jack, I've been in the racket longer than you. So? I never had to do any killing. Murder's a sure way to get the cops down on you. All right for that local stuff, Mary, but this is big time. I'm going to combine all the hot car setups in the entire country. And I'm going to do it fast and sure. By killing? By knocking off the opposition before it gets started. Mary, I can't stand it any well, longer. Take it easy, Carl. All this killing. Stealing cars is bad enough, but murder and more murder. You getting any ideas, Cora? Yes. I'm getting out. I'll leave town, go to work somewhere. Oh, no, you won't. You can't stop me. I'll run away. Cora, the cops have got a set of fingerprints on a murder gun, remember? I just suppose they find out whose prints they are. Now, stop it, both of you. Cora isn't going anywhere. Oh. Cora better not get any ideas. Now, stop crying, Cora. Go potty your nose or something. All right. Mary, I don't like the way Cora acts. It's all this talk about killing. She'll get over it. Cora may be your sister, but... What do you mean? Sister or no sister, she's getting dangerous. I don't like what you're driving You'd at. better. Mary, there might be a time when it'll be either Cora or you. Shut up. Cora's no danger. I'll control her. You better. you in the laboratory, Peters. We've just completed an analysis of the gun used in the Sam French murder, Chief. Good. We've confirmed at least one police deduction. A woman handled the gun after the fatal bullet was fired. We found some particles of face powder in the barrel of the gun. The girl apparently had put the gun in her bag, then took the gun out and dropped it near French's body. It was a type of powder. High grade, but sold commonly in department stores of the better kind. A deep shade. The girl evidently is a dark brunette. This is confirmed by a smear of lipstick on the gun. The lipstick is dark, almost purple, the kind used by girls with black hair. Well, that's a big help, Peters. We've got to find that girl. She's the key to this particular car-stealing racket. Chief, there are only 140 million persons in the United States. Half are men, remember. That still leaves 70 million. Hardly. The murder took place in New York. We can reasonably infer that the girl's a New York resident. New York City, most probably. I'll go along with you on that, Chief, but it still leaves about 7 million persons. Three and a half million women. Not if you stop to think a minute, Peters. Most women have hair of varying shades of brown. Blondes and extreme brunettes are in the minority. That's right. And here's something else. This girl was driving Sam French's car. It's reasonable to assume that she had a driver's license. That's exactly, Peters. That narrows it to a girl with black hair, eyes probably deep brown or black, who has a driver's license and is on file with the Motor Vehicle Bureau in New York. At best, Chief, there'll still be several hundred girls in New York answering to that description. That's true enough. Now, have we received an analysis of the murder car? Not yet, but it may come through at any time. A chemical analysis of the dust on the floor of the car, dust from the shoes of the driver, will isolate still further the neighborhood where this girl lives. It's logical. Peters, order a plane for New York. I've got an idea. We may be able to locate the girl who was with Sam French. in about an hour, Chief. That's fine. If we're reasoning correctly. This case ought to break tomorrow. That's New York calling, Chief. Harding to New York. Go ahead. Eight, New York to Harding. Plan 14 put into operation. All preliminaries covered. Awaiting reaction of subject involved. Very good, J-6. You'll arrive in New York within the hour. I'll meet you at field headquarters. Come on, move up, 
please, lady? I got this notice to bring my license to the Motor Vehicle Bureau. Uh, you're in the right place, lady. You got your right license? Yes, but I don't understand why I... You and all the rest of the people online, all we want is your license. You'll be given new ones. Oh, here it is. Uh, anything wrong with it? Not a thing. We're starting to issue a new form, that's all. Let's see, uh, Cora Linton, address, good enough. Sit down, your name will be called and the new blanks filled out. No additional fee. Oh, there you are, Cora. Jack was asking about you. Yeah, and it ain't love, baby. I'd just like to see you close to home. Oh, can I leave the house for five minutes? You've been gone all afternoon. I had to go down to the motor vehicle bureau, that's all. Make me a drink, will you, sir? Sure. Motor vehicle bureau? What's the matter, your license expired? No, they wanted me to come there, and that's that. Here's your drink, Cora. That motor vehicle story smells fishy. I got the notice. I can prove it here. Take a look at this, Mr. Smart Money. Yeah. So you had to bring your license to the motor vehicle bureau, huh? They just took my license and gave me a new one. Me and thousands of other girls. Yeah? No men? I didn't notice. Come to think of it, no, only girls. Oh, forget about it. Women's Day at the Motor Vehicle Bureau. Have a drink, Jim. No. Let's talk about it some more, Cora. What kind of women were they? I don't know. Girls, young women. Only young women, huh? Lots of brunettes. I don't... What do you mean? What fighting you, Jack? Look, suppose the cops figured out it was a black-haired young dame who drove Sam French's car. Somebody might have seen her and Sam. Well, they couldn't have. We didn't stop anywhere. Well, you must have stopped for a red light. Somebody saw you. So the cops play it smart. They look up all the driver's license. They call in all the black-haired dames on some phony excuse. Oh, you're crazy. There was a room full of people. You hand in your old license. It's got your fingerprints all Jack, over it. don't go getting any ideas. I had one all along. Jack, don't shoot! Let go my arm. I'm so help me. I'll let you have it you first. You can't do it. You can't oh, kill me. Oh, oh, no, stop it. Look look it up, right, oh. Chief. Drop it, I tell you. Oh, drop it. Lucky oh. for you, miss. The superintendent was around when oh, I was in. I'm so glad you're here, even if you are the police. United States counter spies. What did I tell you? I knew Cora would fix us. But she ain't getting away with it. That's a girl who killed Sam French. Her fingerprints are on a murder case. He's cut. lying. Please, listen to me. He's lying. Our innocent. She was with Sam French, but Jack killed him. Shut up, you fool. You're getting your own neck in Quiet and let the lady talk. I'll talk. I'll talk plenty. I imagine you will, Miss Linton, but at best it'll just confirm the evidence we have concerning your car-stealing setup. All right, Peters, take them to headquarters. David Harding will be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's exciting case. Say, I sure want to hear about that. I heard it was sensational. But, uh, don't you want to hear about old Nick Candy Bars first, Jimmy? Now, look, Mr. Krupp, Roger. What can you tell me about old Nick Candy Bars? I enjoy one every day. That's all I need to know. But, uh, what about those folks who've never had the pleasure of tasting old Nick? Never tasted old Nick Candy Bar? Is it possible? That's right. Even though old Nick has been a favorite of millions for over a quarter century, there are still some folks who've never enjoyed that smooth, thick chocolate coating. The crunchy peanuts and buttery rich caramel? And the creamy fudge. Four famous candies blended into one delicious bar. Now, what do you know? Well, what'll we do? Tell them! Tell them? Oh, Nick! Oh, boy! Oh, Nick is a wonderful candy bar! <laughs> As Jimmy points out, you've missed a rare treat if you've missed old Nick. Get some old Nick candy bar soon. Why not this evening? You'll like old Nick. <laughs> This is David Harding speaking. For months, Private First Class Fred Parker, stationed with the American occupation troops in Europe, had looked forward to his wife and family joining him. But a certain man in this country had other ideas, ideas which included gambling, murder, and double cross. How these different elements, thousands of miles apart, suddenly came into focus makes next week's Counterspy broadcast an exciting, timely expose. I invite you to listen. Sunday, August 4th, same time, same station. <laughs>
David Hardy Counter Spy is a Philip Sage Lord production. <laughs> 3345 3345 <laughs>